Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being back here almost on time. See? Uh, I hope you had enjoyed your lunch. And now we'll continue with the afternoon session. We will actually start where we ended with Carlos Schneider. And now he will talk to us about the ethics proceedings. Please, Carlos, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Hello again to everyone. Um, well, again, thank you for the organizers again to give me the opportunity to speak about my second passion in sports law, which is ethics. And uh, well, first of all, I think it's not the best timing of having a presentation just after lunch. I know it because I'm half German, but I'm also half Spanish and normally this time in Spain is more a time to take a nap than to hear um, an explanation of the ethics proceedings. Nevertheless, as I am really excited with this topic, I will try my best to, to also um, uh, give you also this, this feeling that I, that I have with ethics. So, first of all, I will revert back to one of the explanations of today given by by Oliver about the, the new code of ethics, but very briefly. Why? Because it's, a, it's an important tool that from FIFA we thought that it was the right moment to, to change it because, as I put here on bold, it's, um, it's a consequence of this cause of transparency, which I think is the main idea also, one of the main ideas of having this event is to be transparent and one, I think one of the expressions of this transparency in 2018 was, in fact, the new code. So, what are, very briefly, the objectives of this uh, revision was to give, as I said, more transparency, a better understanding of the proceedings for the persons involved, better definitions, more a clarified structure, more better articles, and notions and specify sanctions, for instance, and this is something, well, it's uh, something important in the sense that uh, if someone is facing an ethics procedure that for a breach of a certain article, this person, this person now is able a little bit to, to predict what the outcome might be if he or she is declared guilty. Also, a very important aspect here is the precision given in matters of the differentiation between the investigatory chamber and the adjudicatory chamber. And very important here is also what we are trying is to empower confederations and associations to deal with their own matters. FIFA is trying to distribute this task, this burden, and this responsibility. So in the end, the, I think the, 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 the statement that should prevail here is to give more certainty regarding the conduct that is to be expected from the persons bound by the FIFA Code of Ethics. So what does it mean, uh, ethics procedure? So first, I think uh, when someone is looking at this scheme, the first uh, idea is, oh, what the heck, after lunch, why should I be, why shouldn't I be outside? Okay, but this scheme, even though it, it appears to be complex, it's very easy to explain. So this is more or less what an ethic procedure is about. We have a potential breach and the needs to go to the investigatory chamber. The investigatory chamber, so that you know very briefly, is the first chamber who gets in contact with this potential breach. How? Different ways. We have a platform, which is BKMS, which is for whistleblowers. We can have information coming from media. We can have also information coming from other units, integrity unit, compliance, MAs. And also normal complaints coming either from officials, but also from, party, from, from private persons. 
And all this comes to the investigatory chamber and opens what we call normally here the preliminary investigations. So we are now here, I don't know where it is. So we are now here, so preliminary investigations. What is the outcome of a preliminary investigation? Obviously, when there is a FIFA case, or whether there is no FIFA case, but obviously in law, nothing is so simple. What happens if we have a FIFA case? So what does it really mean? It means that we have a prima facie case. We have strong indications that there is a, an infringement, but also this needs to be combined with the element of competence. The element of competence is new with the new code, and it only observes three different situations. When it's a person appointed by FIFA, a person exercising duties uh, related to FIFA, or when it involves FIFA fund. For that, there is an exclusive competence of FIFA. So we have the case, we have the prima facie case. What happens then? Formal investigations ending up in a final report transferred to the adjudicatory chamber who will decide on the case and eventually issue a decision. Also a decision that may go to CAS. So the half of the scheme is done. So, but what happened when there is no FIFA case? What does it mean? So first, as I said, these two elements, First, no prima facie case. There are no indications at all that something happened. Case closed. No competence indications that something happened, but FIFA has no competence. What happened then? So the new code, as I, as I mentioned before, what it tries is to empower associations, confederations to deal with their own matters. And this is why FIFA said, okay, we are not competent, so please deal with this matter. And again, we have here two options. We have a proper decision that may eventually end up in CAS, and we have a non-proper decision. What does it mean? Well, the code in its Article 30, Paragraph 2, is explaining this situation. A proper decision is when there is, when, when there is, not, there is no expectancy of having the decision, or the, the decision that is expected, or the decision that has been issued, is completely against the spirit of the Code of Ethics. In those situations, extremely exceptional, and I think uh, more exceptional, rather extraordinary, then CAS, throughout this Article 30, Paragraph 2, takes back this competence, and then back to the final report, go to the adjudicatory chamber, goes to decision and eventually to cast. So this is, these are ethics proceedings before FIFA. So what, but what happened in 2018? We had 14 adjudicatory chamber decisions. Well, we had, out of this, we had 10 decisions about bribery and corruption, sadly two about match manipulation, one about offering gifts, and one about harassment or discrimination. So this, in throughout six different adjudicatory chamber meetings, where they dealt with 16 cases and with the final outcome of 14 decisions. So more figures. We had, this is what happened, in, in recent years. So we can say that uh, we are in a positive dynamic, meaning that we have, so I divided that in formal investigations and, and adjudicatory chamber proceedings. So I am sure that you all know now what I'm meaning with that. So um, formal investigations, as I said, we think we are confident that we are entering in a positive dynamic because we, are, we had well, positive dynamic from a work perspective. Obviously, no one wants to have many cases regarding ethic issues. But again, so we got more formal investigations open in 2018 than in 2017. And we got more cases sent to the Adjudicatory Chamber in 2018 than in 2017. And the same goes for the Adjudicatory Proceedings. We got more starting 
AC pre proceedings and more decisions than in the previous years. And I added, because in this spirit of the positive dynamic in which we are entering, and I may revert afterwards uh, why I think also it's a very positive dynamic, is that these, I also included some information about this year. For instance, we opened already a number of formal investigations. Obviously, the number will increase throughout the year. We also sent a number, a high number, well, not a high number, but already sent decisions to the Adjudicatory Chamber. And what is, I think, it's more relevant, and this is something that uh, I'm very happy to. To, to, to communicate to you is that we expect already in March of having notified more decisions than in the whole 2018. So, but it's not only the number that counts. I think what is here important is the efficiency that counts. So I took two different periods of time of two years. We got the period of 2015 until 2017 and the period of 2017 until 2019. Okay, so why these two periods? Well, the answer is right below in bold. It says on the one hand from 2015 until 2017, it is normal to have more, it was normal to have more investigations because, regretfully, FIFA was facing some issues with ethics. We got the FIFA gate, we got the DOJ proceedings, Platini, Platter, etc. But on the other, on the other way round, and this is where I think it's also interesting. So it is reasonable to think that we have more formal investigations when. With this, with this situation. But with the new FIFA Code of Ethics, as I said before, what we tried is indeed to empower the confederations and the associations, limiting our competence, and including also other elements that would eventually reduce the number of formal investigations as it was done. But obviously, we kept the pace of being efficient. So, very briefly explained, in numbers, we had in the, in the first period, 15-17, 103 formal investigations, 41 decisions. Then the next period, 48 and 37 decisions. I think the, the right diagram exposes very well that we continued the pace of being efficient, efficient, even though the number of formal investigations is lower. So that was for the figures, and now we are entering in something that is really what I like. I'm a lawyer, I'm very bad with numbers. I think I'm a little bit better in, in legal things. Not good, doesn't mean, but at least a little bit better than with numbers. So what we had last year, and I will explain only again two cases, um, I think, first of all, as an introduction, I don't want to go to the fact. One of the cases is Falke. It's a public uh, award. And the other decision, which is the first one I will explain, is uh, the Chung case. I will not enter into the facts because facts are what they are. They are facts. What I am interested about is the legal analysis behind those facts. So. We go to, to Chung again. This one, uh, at least for my relief, the fact that circumstances are easy to explain. We have the bid of Qatar to 2022. Korea was one of the bidders. It, he, they created normally what is called the bid committee. And in an event uh, uh, called Leaders in Football, COBIT, which was the name of this uh, bid committee, unveiled the project defined as Global Football Fund. What happened next is that Mr. Chung, a former ex-co committee of FIFA, sent a number of letters called the GFF letters 
two different EXCO members. Explaining, exact, not explaining, but indicating how the distribution of the money of this global football fund would eventually take place. So I won't go again to the, to the content of the letter. It's only that the, 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 the allegation was that he was not acting in an ethical manner as he was, uh, so to say, fostering uh, one of the, of, the, of the candidates by revealing information that he was not supposed to reveal. So what the first reaction was of FIFA, and here I will connect that to the first legal uh, point of my intervention, is that uh, obviously the reaction was, oh, you did that? So please, tell me what you did, because it may be an ethical misconduct. This is the first reaction of FIFA, but the second reaction of FIFA, by means of, of its general secretary, was what is written here down. We consider the integrity of the bidding process not to be affected and consequently deemed the matter as closed. Obviously, this brings us to the first legal question. Binding effects of instances of FIFA towards a final decision. In this case, I won't go back to the, to the, to the statement given by the General Secretary at the time. I will go to a more, I think, more, 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 more conflictive statement given by the chairperson at the time of the investigatory chamber, saying that there are no allegations against you or your team uh, 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 addressed to, to one individual. So we have the chairperson of the investigatory chamber telling one guy, one person, uh, be, be relaxed, there are no allegations, either against you or your team. So does that have, and here comes the, legal, the first legal question, does that have a binding effect to the adjudicatory chamber? Cass said no. So Indeed, it said this cannot bind the adjudicatory chamber, neither the appeal committee, and of course not CAS. And here is the interesting part, which I think it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, incoordinated in the decision, but I think it's extremely important and interesting, because what is CAS is doing now is to explain exactly what the investigatory chamber duties are and what the adjudicatory chamber's duties are. Investigatory chamber is determining the prima facie case, conducting investigations, forwarding the investigation files, and eventually recommending a sanction. This is what they do. But who is deciding on a case is the adjudicatory chamber. Sometimes uh, I think things need to be written down to be clear to everyone. But this is common sense. It's common sense written down, included in a <coughs> CAS award. So next question, principle of predictability. So why, why this principle? Obviously because what was applied against Mr. Chung was uh, uh, called uh, Article 3, which, uh, which contains uh, the wording that any official show, show, show commitment to an ethical attitude. So the, the, the argument of the, of, 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 of the appellant I think it's a fair argument. This is a very broad, unprecise uh, definition. Why? Sh I, need, I need to know more. I need to have something more specific. But, and this is, I think, also very interesting from this, ca from this case, is that Cass said it is unnecessary and impractical to list all acts. What you need is that the official, by reading the rule, could clearly make the, distinct, the distinction between what is ethical and what is not, what is to act in a credibility and integrity manner and what is not. And it continues, and it says that the inherent vagueness of concepts such as ethics and integrity does not preclude them to be used by the sport legislator to impose sanctions. So for me, this is extremely important because this is a question that is coming on and on, not only in, in ethics, but uh, also in, in disciplinary. And I think Cass was smart here because it said, 
This is not only happening here. This is happening also in other regulations. We had, for instance, we are sports organizations, for instance, are imposing sanctions because of unsportsmanlike, for lack of loyalty, which are also very vague, but still have the enough clarity to, um, to, to produce disciplinary sanctions. So, and here we come. So this is one of the, the part which, uh, in this spirit of being transparent and everything, which is a little bit embarrassing for FIFA. And all this uh, embarrassment is summarized in one sentence given by, by Cass, which is justice delayed is justice denied. What happened here, and uh, it's something that uh, I think, uh, uh, well, when we win, we are very happy. When we lose, we need to learn. And this is a point, a specific point, where I think FIFA, uh, we need to learn and that we need to improve. What happened here is that Mr. Chung, the date of the hearing, was no longer serving any sanction, any suspension. Why was that? The panel says that it was because of the FIFA's excessive and unjustified delays in issuing the grounds for its two decisions. So, here, very summarized in the next point is the definition of justice delayed and justice denied. What Cass is saying that is that if you have the right to appeal, you need to enjoy also the right that the date you have the sanction or the date you have the decision, you don't have to, you don't have to serve the full suspension. So, I think it's a matter of fairness, and I think it's also fair to, 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 to say or to admit that this is not good, that we are improving, and uh, that it's our commitment that this, obviously, I, don't, I cannot <laughs> see what uh, will happen in the future, but, but uh, I'm, very, I'm extremely confident with the team uh, that we have and uh, the capacities of everyone that such thing won't happen again in the near future. So, sanction was to, um, so he already uh, served the, the ban, and to cancel the pecuniary sanction of 50,000, mainly because the delay of FIFA. Second and last, uh, and last um, decision, I think, if I take the five minutes, I think I'm right on time. It's Falke case. Again, this is a case where I won't go to the merits of the case. The case is like that. The case is published. You can find it uh, on the internet. What I will uh, analyze is a very specific legal, uh, legal question, which is interesting also for us to know more about how we can act from an ethical perspective, an ethical procedure. So, very briefly, what happened there? Six accounts, sale of World Cup tickets, travel expenses, conflict of interest, gifts given to one person, allegedly destruction of evidence, and also a lack of duty to cooperate. So, but the main question, and what I think was very important, uh, very interesting in this case, was has FIFA the authority to ethically suspend its general secretary? Why? Because, because mainly he is an employee of FIFA and is an employee of FIFA under the umbrella of the ethical rules. And this is, I think, a fair and very interesting question. So what is a general secretary? He is, according to the status, the chief executive of the general secretary. So Mr. Falk was appointed by the FIFA, appointed by the FIFA executive committee on, in June. And he, was, he signed his employment contract in, uh, in, in July. So in 2015, he was suspended. And in January 2016, he terminated his contract. So, we have two different legal frameworks here applicable. The Swiss labor law, 
and the FIFA regulations. First, first thing, first uh, remark is Swiss law. What is the power of Swiss law in FIFA procedures? And Article 58, as established by CAS, says that it is clearly indicated in this, in this rule that in principle, the FIFA regulations always take precedence of Swiss, over Swiss law. So sometimes you read Swiss law and you think Swiss law is, applies first and then the rest. No, it's the other way around. First we apply the FIFA rules and then for the gaps, we may fill that with Swiss law. So and here it comes the, the, the key thing with this, with this case, relationship between Swiss labor law and association law. Is FIFA entitled to sanction uh, the general secretary? The, the answer is yes. Why yes? Because it's what is called here role splitting. In French, the doublement functionnel. So the same person is, so to say, it's a little bit uh, schizophrenic, but it's the way it is, is like divided in two different persons. One person, which is a sort of organ of FIFA appointed by the EXO committee, and by that, the FIFA regulations apply on them, on, on him, on her, which is including here the ethical regulations. And then another one, another person and the same person, the same individual, which is the employee of FIFA. And for that, we only apply the Swiss labor law. It means that this person possess rights and oblig obligations vis-a-vis -vis each other under two different sets of rules. This also means that FIFA had the power to sanction the appellant, as it did, on the basis of association law without being limited by employment law. Obviously, they are limited by the public order, but not in that specific role in Swiss labor law. Final slide, and with that, I'm finished. Violation of the Nevis in Eden, of the principle of Nevis in Eden, doesn't play here any role again. Because the interest, the, the, the state is, is different, and also the purpose of the termination of the appellant employment contract is different than the one of the purpose, than the purpose for the disciplinary sanction. And with that, I finish. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is my last presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. So do we have any questions for Carlos? Yes, we have in the middle on the top. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marcos. Thank you, FIFA, for the opportunity. Carlos, congratulations for the presentation. Quick question. If you could, uh, in Mr. Volker's case, if you could explain uh, basically the parameters used by FIFA to make a difference, to establish a difference between bribery and gift. Well, well I, can, I, can, I can answer you that very, very quickly. And uh, well, first of all, and uh, I'm sorry for that, but I have to use like the typical safety disclaimer. We need to go for a case by case, case uh, basis, um, um, but the difference is very clear. For a bribery, you need the, the reaction of the one who is bribed. That means that quid pro quo. Needs, you don't only need the gift, but you need that the guy for you are giving a gift is doing something for that bribe. If he's doing nothing, then it's a, it's a gift. If he's doing something which is like the, the, the agreement between the parties, then uh, you, we will be facing a bribery case. Thank you. Corruption. Do we have another question? Yes. We have another question in the middle. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Carlos, for the nice presentation. I'm Ignacio Triguero from San Ferrero. Uh, I have a quick question for you. 
Uh, how is uh, FIFA going to deal with um, the growing, let's say, uh, interest of betting companies in football and the Article 26, I think it's the 26 of the Code of Ethics, uh, where there's a ban to, to uh, well, to enter into betting agreements and how's the, the, the position of FIFA or do you have already some case law or...? Well, this is... Let me say this is a, a very complex uh, question because the, the, fra the legal framework in match fixing uh, here at FIFA is also not so straightforward. We have the disciplinary code and it's uh, dealing with match fixing uh, issues and we have the ethic code which is also dealing with, with match fixing. So first question is we need to establish there in which situations we apply one or the other, mainly because there is a, a thing which is, it's, a, it's what it is, but it's that we have different prescription periods. For disciplinary code, there is none. For ethics, there is 10 years. So this is a first um, difficulty that we are facing. And it is directly related to, to, the, to the case because for betting and match fixing, obviously there is a, a connection that you need to establish. So in the, the difficulty, and I'm, I'm, I'm here just speaking also part of what my view is on, on those situations, is that uh, it's not so easy to, to engage, to connect betting fix of the match and an individual, which would be the ethical approach, then uh, betting, match fixing, and a club and or an association. So that makes a, 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 a big difference in the sense of how do you approach a case. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one. It's, uh, I can only explain you the situation and the problematic. I cannot really go more, far, more, more, <laughs> more into detail on that because, uh, again, a disclaimer of on a case-by-case -case basis. But this is uh, just difficult, difficult, uh, difficult thing, difficult task. Thank you, Carlos. Another question? I see. Two more questions, and then we need to continue. Hello. Uh, it's Mohamed Sami from Qatar Stars League. Um, thank you very much for uh, raising the matter of ethics. Um, I have a question regarding the national law. We are speaking on uh, national federation level. Um, if uh, an ethic, because sometimes the an unethical behavior is also a criminal or criminalized behavior by the National Penal Code. If this is the case, uh, what do you think is preferable for the National Federation to take? Is to deal with the matter uh, internally with its uh, ethics committee or to transfer the matter to the authorities completely? Um, I have a second question if, if it's possible. It's um. easy to say, but mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, to implement. I, my background is uh, Spanish and uh, French law. And um, in Spanish law, it, uh, sometimes we say, we, we can say, the case is hijacked by, by, the, Span by, by, the, by the authorities. So, so you don't have access to the file, you don't have access to the evidence. So, that makes your task and role a little bit more difficult. But it doesn't mean at all that because there is a criminal procedure that you cannot act against this, this conduct. And this is why I say, if you're asking me, I would try my best to act internally as far as, as, as you can. Thank you. There is a possibility for a second question or? I don't know. Very we had one more in the back. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Sean Cottrell from Law and Sport. Um, 
you've talked about increasing the competencies and, and, and pushing down the responsibility on confederations and national associations. Could you shed some light on how you go about increasing their competency and ensuring, I would imagine, that something that may be problematic would be that how if you have unethical behaviour or a behaviour in breach of the code, that there is a, a, uh, an effective reporting mechanism? And then at what point do you step in if a national association or confederation does not take appropriate action? What is the consequences for them not upholding the regulations? Thank you. Or well, the code of ethics. Well, my, what I said before is that this situation needs to be not only exceptional, but extraordinary. So I tried to a little bit, uh, my English is not uh, very good, but I tried a little bit to even put higher the, the threshold so that we can enter into such uh, matters. So I have to admit that from the date of the, of the enforcement of the, of, the, of the code, nothing alike happened. So we don't have any experience yet on a situation like that. But I assume that uh, also in connection to, to, the, to, to the case before, justice denied, is justice delayed. Is, um, so, so, so we should assess the cases individually and see then, obviously, in the light of jurisprudence, in the light of the, of the number of evidence, for instance, we have a case, I don't like to speak on hypothetical situations. This is something that I completely uh, avoid because any, any situation is, is particular. But if we would have a, a situation where it's clear evidence demonstrated that something happened and the case on a confederation level is delayed without a, a, a sanction at first, then we will push uh, so to tell them, please let us know when you will decide on that. And then, if it's not coming, then we might bring back the case to us, and then let's see, let's see, then, then face the consequences of that. Meaning that maybe the association or the confederation is complaining, but then we need to play also the, this, the, this game. Therefore, for the first, and then maybe if we have a, a case of bribery and the, the sanction is a warning, well, if from an objective point of view, this, uh, th this outcome is completely inappropriate, we are entitled to bring back the case and face again and play this game. So, because the purpose here is to, to act against uh, ethical misbehaviors, and this is, I think, something that we all share in football. Sorry, and where, where's, sorry, where's the, thank you for that, but where's the report, is there a, a key place, say, for example, I was aware of certain behavior or conduct, uh, Excuse is there me? A, where, where would it go to? Do you see what I mean? Because around the world there's... Uh, sorry, I'll repeat that. If I was to suspect of anything, or any of the colleagues in the room were to s s see suspicious behaviour of some sort, where would I go to report it? Because that mechanism you're describing only works if the information's been able to go somewhere in the first place. You're asking, how do you report it? By any means. By any means. You can use the, uh, the ethics... Uh, uh, email, you can use a, a normal career, uh, you can use the platform if you don't want to be, to be named, uh, you can use any means, any means, any means possible that could reach to FIFA. FIFA would be like the, the, the let's say, the metaphoric building of, of the post office of those claims, and then we would start, yes. Thank you. Good, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you very much, Mario, for your presentations. You. Now we will continue with, it's an open secret, my favorite topic, it's player status. And I'm very happy to announce my next two speakers. We have Isabel Montemore, no, Erica Montemore, head of player status, and Isabel Falconer, senior player from player status. Welcome. The floor is yours. There's many thoughts, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's nice to be, see so many familiar faces today. Uh, I've been here in FIFA already for eight years, and it's really the first time that you open the doors and 
for the legal division to present basically the review of our past year, our activities. So for me, it's a rewarding experience. And today I'm here with my team to explain to you the player state of the department, not only the interesting cases, but also give you an overview of what is player status. So first, just, I know you are aware, but just to have an overview that the regulatory basis we work with is the FIFA statutes, the regulation and status and transfer of players. We have our own procedural rules. And I mean, even if it's not the most famous topics, we also have a match agent regulations. And within this regulatory framework is that we have our competence that covers many matters. So it goes from contractual and labor disputes to overdue payables, solidarity mechanism and training compensation, change of association and eligibility, registration matters concerning international transfer of players, protection of minors, match agents, and also release of players. So as you can see, it covers a wide range of matters, which is the reason why also why we're the biggest department in the legal division. And so basically, uh, more than 20 years ago, player status was actually composed of five employees, I'm sorry. And today, we are an international team of 38 employees coming from 13 different countries to deal with all these matters that we're going to speak today. Uh, we're mostly composed by lawyers, but we also have administrative staff to cope with the workload we have. So it's also since this is an opportunity to speak about the department, it's also that you are aware of the amount of cases that we have. So as Emilio said, we're not a perfect organization, but we're definitely moving forward and looking into ways to improve and be more efficient. Um, but this is also important that you understand the amount of cases that are dealt on a yearly basis. So just so you have an overview, last year, more than 5,000 decisions were issued. Um, more than 1,000 cases related to uh, the, within the competence of the dispute resolution chamber and the player status committee, that from now on I will say DRC and PSC, just to avoid the repetition. And more than 4,000 cases decided by the subcommittee, which is related to protection of minors, the guidance copy we present to you today. So that's the reason why the big department. And also, since it's the first time, I know we're supposed to talk about 2018 only, but I'm going to go back a bit before just so that you understand that in the past three years, there's been a increase in the amount of cases submitted uh, of a 30%. Matthijs will also talk about uh, TMS, and you'll see that uh, the cases in TMS have had also a great impact on our workload. Um, again, I know that we are still not perfect, but I think it was already a great improvement on the case handling, on the average of the investigation phases. We still have complicated cases that might take longer, but we also have fast-track proceedings like overdue payables and ITC, and minors there are much faster, so we're going forward in a good way. Um, and also a uh, big thanks to all the members of our deciding bodies that we have more meetings than in the past, and there's also an increase of 17% of cases submitted and decided by the different deciding bodies. Uh, then now I'll actually go to, into the cases that we're going to see today, uh, together with Isabel, um, and I'm going to focus on dispute resolution chamber. Uh, as the same as Carlos, I'm not going to really focus so much on facts, but on the interesting uh, jurisprudence of the DRC and also of CAS. Um, so the first case I'm going to look into is regarding proportionality of compensation clauses. Uh, as you're aware, we have also uh, outstanding remuneration cases, but the most interesting ones are the ones related to breach of contract and the consequences of the early termination of a contract. I'm not going to go into Article 17. I know you're all very aware, but just to remind that so the parties can always agree in the contract the consequences of early termination, but if they don't, or if the clause for some reason is not applicable, then Article 17 applies, and the DRC decides and calculates the, the, co the compensation 
within the scope of Article 17, take into account the various factors, the objective criteria, and the non-exhaustive list of factors. So the first case uh, is a case where you can see I put the, our, our decisions are published online, they're anonymized. We're under discussions with uh, the stakeholders to see if in the future it could be published without being anonymized, but currently it still is like this. And so that's why I put the reference of the decision. Uh, in this specific case, um, there was a natural termination by the club. And when the club terminated the contract, it simply make, made reference to a clause in the contract. The player, of course, was not happy and uh, lodged a claim before FIFA. What did the clause say? The clause foreseen uh, the compensation in case of termination to just cause or due to the mutual termination. And in this case, the consequences were different depending on who terminated the contract. So in case the club would terminate the contract, the player would be entitled to receive one monthly salary. On the opposite case, if the player would terminate the contract, the club would receive the entire remuneration foreseen in the contract. So the DRC had to analyze the case and see the arguments of the parties. Basically, uh, the player argued that the clause was not valid, first of all. Second, that in any case, it only referred to the consequences of the termination, and therefore that the club did not have just cause to terminate the contract. <laughs> the club from its side said, we agree on the contract, and therefore I should only pay the amount agreed, which is one monthly salary. The DRC analyzed the case, the arguments of the parties, the documents, and the conclusion was that this comp the compensation clause was actually in, in, in direct confrontation of the party's balance of equal rights, since it clearly favored the club and prejudice of the player. Therefore, he understood that the compensation clause was not applicable and went to calculate the compensation based on Article 17. So this is uh, it's the, the well-established jurisprudence, jurisprudence of the chamber. And this is one of the cases that I thought it was interesting to show you. Then moving forward again with, with a compensation clause, but now regarding principle, principle of reciprocity, which here I think it was interesting to bring two cases, also to show that sometimes uh, the Court of Arbitration for Sports also have decisions in different directions. Um, so here, first of all, um, the player simply terminated the contract. And based in Article 6.7 of the contract, and this was during the validity of the employment contract. This clause determined that the compensation would be, in this case, the, comp the whole remuneration in the contract. Um, the player lodged a claim asking for compensation, and the DRC determined that at the time of the termination, more than 40% of the remuneration due to him was outstanding. Therefore, applying at, uh, the clause of the contract, the player had just cause, and the club had to pay compensation. However, the DRC said the consequences foreseen are not reciprocal, because it only foresees the consequence from one party and not to the other. Therefore, the DRC, according to its jurisprudence, decided not to apply. And again, went to calculate compensation based on Article 17. Uh, the club was not uh, happy with the decision and appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And in this case, it was a sole arbitrator, and he confirmed the, the decision of the DRC in the sense that the player had just cause, and even highlighted that even if there was no default notice, which usually the player needs to do before terminating a contract, because the clause specifically established that after 45 days the player can terminate the contract, it says that had priority over the general rule of default notice. On the other hand, uh, the solar arbitrator understood that contrary to the DRC decision, the clause was a liquidated damages and it was not necessary to be reciprocal. However, it confirmed the amount granted because since the player did not appeal the decision, basically the amount granted was confirmed. Interesting here is that here the solar arbitrator went uh, in accordance with the latest CAS jurisprudence, which is that the, that the Swiss law does not require penalty clause to be reciprocal and they can still be applied. 
The next case is also regarding reciprocity, and this is more a different case. I'm not going to enter so much into facts, but just to give an overview, the 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 club lodged a claim saying that the player had terminated the contract without just cause, but there was a dispute regarding the duration of the contract. Before the DRC, the club failed to prove that the contract was still running, and therefore the player did not breach the contract when terminated. The DRC therefore decided that no compensation should be awarded to the club. The club, again, was not happy and appealed the decision uh, to CAS. But in this case, I also want to highlight, since we have the opportunity to present our cases, is that the, the uh, CAS considered that actually the contract was still valid, but in this case, because it admitted new evidence submitted by the club that was not submitted before the chamber. Since then, at appeal level, the club was able to demonstrate that the contract was still valid, and therefore the club had no just cause. It decided to grant compensation for the club. However, in this case, and similar to the other case, there was only a compensation clause in favor of a player. And therefore, in this case, the CAS did a different approach and decided that the, that clause was not applicable. And decided to apply the residual salary method in accordance with Article 17. What is uh, interesting here is that, therefore, it actually went against the latest CAS uh, jurisprudence and confirmed the DRC jurisprudence um, that because the clause is unilateral, unilateral in nature and solely for the benefit of the club, it should not be applicable. So as you can see, there's still discussions on whether or not the reciprocity is important, and I, I think it's still analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the specific circumstances of a case. Also, what is interesting here that I will also uh, tackle in the next case is that they, again, had a discussion on whether or not there is one way to calculate compensation. And they confirm, as in Matuzalain, that is in a case-by-case -case basis, and that the CAS panel is always free to find the appropriate amount within Article 17 for each case. Now I'll go for the final case before I pass on to Isabel. Uh, it's a breach of contract of the player, and it's, again, the calculation of compensation, but I think this specific case was very interesting to see the different methods of calculating a compensation in case of breach of contract done by the player. Um, this is a case where I'm just going to give you some facts so you understand afterwards the discussion of the compensation without entering too much details. But this was a youth, a Ukrainian player and Ukrainian club that had a contract. At the end of the first year, the player left on vacation and moved to Russia and informed the club that he was moving and no longer coming back. The player went, then went on to training with uh, the Russian club Rubin Kazan uh, without ever being registered or signing a contract, and then subsequently signed a contract with the other Russian club, UFA. <coughs> this club actually contacted Shakhtar asking for the transfer of the player. Shakhtar, of course, uh, opposed and said that there was a contract valid still running. Um, while UFA, insisted that considered the player had just cause to terminate because of the political situation in Ukraine. Uh, of course, as you know, once the parties do not agree regarding the transfer, then of international transfer, FIFA is called to make a decision, and so this case was submitted, and the player status committee uh, granted the provisional registration of the player. Finally, the last fact to then be taken into account for the compensation, is that a year later that he, the contract with UFA, the player was then transferred to Manchester City for a transfer fee. So, of course, uh, Shakhtar was not happy, and uh, after the, the provisional registration was done, lodged a claim for breach of contract against the player and the new club. Um, and the decision of the DRC was that actually the player, when terminated the contract, did not invoke any valid reasons and did not make any effort to continue with the contract. And since one of the pillars of our regulations is the contractual stability, uh, the termination of a contract should be ultima ratio, and therefore the player did not have just cause to terminate the contract. The DRC then calculated the, the compensation in accordance with Article 17, 
and in accordance with his jurisprudence, uh, granted the amount uh, doing an average of the salaries. The new club was, of course, considered jointly and severally liable, according to Article 17, to pay the compensation awarded to the club. Uh, again, the case was uh, pure to cast. And in this case, the panel did a good exercise. And I think it was interesting to see that uh, it I decided the first question that it poses, is there a method that should prevail? Is there a method that is better than the other for calculate compensation for the club? So first it says, in the absence of liquidated damages, so since, since there was no clause, Article 17 applied. And then it went to see the different methods. So the player and the new club actually invoke the Webster case and the residual met value method, meaning that they said the only amount that should be awarded as compensation was the remaining salaries owed to the player with Shakhtar. Then it reverted to say FIFA, uh, in its decision, used the average players, so the, the, the remaining value of the salaries owed to the player with the contract with Shakhtar, taking into consideration the new salaries of the new club and doing an average. And finally, it saw that Shakhtar invoked the Methuselah case and therefore the Swiss law positive interest method, meaning that actually the, the club should be compensated in a way that it goes back to the position before a breach would occur. So seeing all these possibilities, the CAS panel actually said, first of all, Article 17, the, the factors listed as objective criteria are not limited. At the same time, there is no reference to replacement costs, lost transfer fees, and other factors. But it's true that in other cases, CAS panels have considered this within the objective criteria. However, what this, the, 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 the panel said, it says, in any case, if it is, if you're talking about lost fees, lost opportunity, replacement of a player, that needs to prove that there is a nexus between the breach of contract and this loss. So ultimately, uh, the panel says, confirmed that it was not convinced that one method should prevail, should prevail, and therefore each case should be, again, on a case-by-case -case basis on its own merits, and each CAS panel is free within the objective criteria foreseen in Article 17 to find the correct solution for each case. Therefore, in this specific case, what did the panel say? Well, first of all, there is no compensation, so Article 17 applies. No positive interest method in this case, why? First of all, because among the, the, the amounts uh, argued by, invoked by, by Shakhtar for compensation was the transfer fee paid by Manchester City. So, well, this was a year after, so you cannot, there's no correlation. Also, the amount of replacement players that were provided, there was no link with the value of the player, they could not prove that. And third of all, the offer, they alleged there would be an offer of Rubin Kazan, but there was no proof of that. Therefore, it said no positive interest method will apply. Then what do they say? Well, the methodology applied by the DRC in this case was reasonable and in accordance with Article 17. Moreover, as you know, you can also, one of the criteria is the specificity of sport. And in this case, they said it would not apply because the club was also invoking having uh, invested in the training of the youth player. But they said, well, in any case, Shakhtar was already rewarded by that, for that by receiving training compensation and solidarity mechanisms. Therefore, what the CAS panel says basically is that the decision of the DRC was correct and confirmed the decision. I have now passed the floor to Isabel Falconen and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, uh, Erika, for this um, uh, first part of the presentation regarding employment-related disputes. I will continue uh, by presenting you three cases decided by the Dispute Resolution Chamber in 2018. Um, starting with a uh, first very interesting case, quite unusual case in my view, in the sense that it deals with a concept that we have rarely had the occasion to deal with uh, in the context of our disputes at player status, and that is the concept of sporting just cause. So first of all, let me briefly recall the definition of sporting just cause in accordance with Article 15 of our regulations on the status and transfer of players. 
It is basically the right for an established player to unilaterally terminate his contract with a club at the end of a season during which he has played in less than 10% of official matches, and this without any consequences in particular in terms of sporting sanctions. So looking at this case, I think here the facts of this case are quite important because they are very relevant as to the, assist, the assessment of the uh, sporting just cause. Uh, we have a player here who will uh, remain anonymous, as you know, as we've discussed already. This is a player who was 20 years old when he unilaterally terminated the contract with his club. The club is a prominent club uh, playing in the first division of a major league in Europe. Um, he is terminating the contract at the end of a season during which he has not played one single official match with the club. He considered himself an established player, reason for which he decided to terminate the contract, invoking Sporting Just Cause, duly notifying the club of this in writing at the end of the season. And subsequently, the player went on to sign immediately a new contract with uh, a, a new club. So we received a claim from the player, actually. The player asked the DRC to recognize that he had sporting just cause to terminate the contract, and he was claiming moral damages. Um, the player's position is, as I said, that he considered himself an established player, and this particularly on the basis of his high performance, obviously not during that season where he didn't play a single match, but in the season prior to that. And during that season, he was on loan with a second division club in the same country, and there he played a total of 31 official matches. Um, obviously, the, his former club was not in agreement with his decision to unilaterally terminate the contract and deemed that he did not have sporting just cause. This is why they lodged themselves a counterclaim against the player as well as his new club. The position of the, of the former club was as follows. They say that the player was still a young player in training um, and that he had been always playing with them um, in youth teams, that he was sent on loan because he was no longer eligible to play for these youth teams, and, but he still needed to improve and further train. They also say that the reason for which he didn't uh, play during that season any official match is simply that although he was summoned on a regular basis, he had to compete with four more experienced players in the same position. The DRC obviously heard the positions of the parties um, and had to decide on the matter, and they had to uh, answer to one main question, because obviously it will remain undisputed that the player had not played one single official match during that season. Therefore, the main question was as to whether the player could be considered an established player in accordance with Article 15. As to this question, actually, Article 15 also provides that um, when making the assessment as to whether sporting just cause um, exists, one must take into account the particular circumstances of the player's concrete situation. So this is precisely what the DRC did. And they, in doing this, they um, analyzed some objective particularities to the player's situation, as well as some rather more subjective ones. And among the um, objective particularities, they said at first, well, the player is clearly still young. He terminated his contract at the age of 21. He is still a player in training. Proof of that as well is his loan spell in the previous season to a second division club, loan for free. As we know, uh, loans are also a tool to um, ensure that players further develop their training. What they also said is that the player is um, less experienced, clearly, than his other teammates with similar player characteristics. And finally, as to some more subjective particularities, well, the player could not reasonably expect that he would be a starting, regular starting 11 with the A team of his club in the same way that he was a starting 11 in the season prior with the second division club. 
So as a conclusion, the DRC decided that the player cannot be considered uh, an established uh, player in this particular case, and therefore he did not have sporting just cause to terminate the contract. Consequences of that was that the player was held liable uh, for the breach of contract without just cause and ordered to pay compensation for breach of contract together with his new club. However, no sporting sanctions were imposed in that case. So this is also a very interesting case in terms of calculation of compensation. I, I won't go into that because I think Erica has covered the topic already with a, a previous case. So moving on to the next case, actually two cases that I will present together. Um, two cases that concern contractual clauses that can be uh, complicated to deal with and I think uh, quite interesting for the practitioners here today um, dealing every day with such uh, clauses in contracts. That is penalty clauses and what we call hidden interest clauses. First case, the, the facts of the case are quite simple. Simply the player and club signed a termination agreement whereby the club agreed to pay a certain amount of compensation to the player. What's interesting here is a clause that was uh, that um, was in the termination agreement, uh, highlighted in red here, the relevant part. The fact that uh, in case of um, non-payment of uh, the installments uh, of this uh, termination agreement on time, there would be an additional fine of 10% uh, of the remaining amount due, as well as interest of 1% per month. Um, the player who did not receive any amounts under the termination agreement lodged a claim at the, in front of the DRC and said, well, I haven't received any amounts, I haven't received the principal amount, um, so I am claiming that amount, and on top of it, I am claiming the amount, the penalty of 10% as well as 1% interest. The club, while responding to the claim, says, Actually, they are challenging the, the validity of the termination agreement, so they deem that they do not owe any amounts to the player, but interestingly, they are not specifically challenging the validity of this clause which provides for a penalty and interest. So what did the DRC decide here? The main question actually, I think it was quite clear for the DRC that the agreement was validly concluded and the arguments of the club could not be sustained in this respect. So they went on to analyze the validity of the, penal of the clause that provided for a penalty as well as an interest rate. Well, the DRC following its usual jurisprudence in such matters recognized the application of a penalty plus interest clause as long as both have been contractually agreed upon. This is the condition for both to apply. The DRC said that it must, though, analyze the validity of such a clause using the usual criteria of proportionality and reasonableness. And the, the conclusion that the DRC reached here is that this clause is fully valid in the sense that the, a penalty of 10% of the unpaid principal amount as well as 1% interest per month equaling 12% per year are deemed proportionate and reasonable and can be applied. Therefore, the club had to pay the principal amount as well as 1% interest on that amount until effective payment per month, that is, as well as a penalty of 10% of the principal. And now the second case, um, similar but slightly different basically. The facts are exactly the same in the sense that we have here a termination agreement. I think it's interesting just to compare the two here and what the parties agreed upon. So a certain amount payable in two installments and the contract also includes a clause whereby in case of non-payment the player uh, is entitled to an amount of 1,700 euros on top of the principal amount for each day of delay. What happened is that the club paid the first installment but with 13 days delay, whereas the second installment remained unpaid. The player lodged his claim, says, I deem that the club owes me um, 
1,700 euros times 13 days of delay over the first installment, as well as the entire second installment, plus the 1,700 euros per day, again, on that installment until effective payment. The club says they acknowledge that the, the delay in payment of the first installment, as well as the failure to pay the second installment, but they requested the ERC to reduce the what they call a penalty fee, which it considers disproportionate. The DRC decided and asked itself this main question, what is the exact nature of this penalty fee and is the clause in question valid? Since obviously uh, it remained uncontested that the, uh, the principal amount was due, then uh, the, first of all the DRC established that the penalty fee uh, is in fact a hidden interest rate. That is because it is not a fixed amount, but rather an amount that increases in time depending on the moment that the amount is paid. The DRC considered that this interest rate in fact corresponds to an annual interest of 738% and 275%. Therefore, this is clearly grossly disproportionate, and as a result, the DRC has a discretion to reduce that interest rate to an amount of 18% per annum, which is the maximum under Swiss law. Uh, following here, again, it's usual jurisprudence in such cases, so the club was ordered to pay, on top of the principal amount, that interest rate until effective payment. So that is basically it for this review of employment-related disputes. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and Erica and myself will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the panel? No? So if we don't have any questions now, maybe you will have some later if you feel shy. So then I am happy to announce my next speaker. It's Gauden Scoprium, FIFA Senior Group Leader at Player Status, and he will explain to you the matters of international moves of players. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to uh, give you a few uh, facts and figures to the topic of the international transfers of players. I will uh, talk in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes about uh, the registration process following the international move of a player. Then I will focus on the protection of minors. And finally, I will give you some information on the international clearance procedure. If a player is over the age of 18, the new association is able to request the ITC for him during an open registration period, and the former association and the former club agree to issue the ITC for the player. He can be immediately registered and play for his new club without any problem. However, there are a bit more complicated scenarios, and those are the cases where FIFA is uh, asked to intervene. First, if the player is under the age of 18, his international transfer is in principle not allowed. The transfer can only proceed with the uh, approval of FIFA, and this is only granted in exceptional circumstances. The second scenario uh, concerns situations where uh, the new association is not able to request the ITC within an open registration window and uh, none of the regulatory exceptions for unemployed players applies. In this case, uh, the transfer is blocked in TMS. The, in TMS, a so-called validation exception arises and the transfer can only proceed um, once FIFA has authorized the ITC request outside the registration period. Then the second, uh, the third scenario is uh, if the ITC has been uh, 
requested but not delivered by the former association, then uh, the player can only be registered based on provisional measures issued by uh, FIFA. I will obviously not read you the uh, article out loud here. We all know the Article 19 um, that has uh, created quite a big uh, workload for us. I will focus on the, uh, what it means to put this article into practice and uh, the results that derive from the practical application of this Article 19. As you can see, over the last years, uh, the number of minor applications has constantly increased. Last year, we have uh, received an all-time high of over almost 4,500 applications. We take this as a good sign because we deem that uh, more cases means, in principle, a higher level of compliance by the clubs and associations with the existing rules. If we look a bit closer, um, based on the exceptions uh, of the applications that we have been submitted, we see that uh, the vast majority, almost 50% still concern the parents' move relocation not linked to football. Only very few cases um, uh, concern exceptions that are not included in the regulations and are based on jurisprudence. Maybe in, if I give you a bit uh, a figure, compared to last year, we received more than 20% uh, cases. So this means a lot of work for us, and, but we also took measures, obviously, to, to deal with this uh, challenge. When the subcommittee was asked uh, to deal with uh, the minor players moving for humanitarian reasons and for uh, uh, participating in exchange programs, the subcommittee was from the very beginning, and this is already now already a few years since uh, such cases have come up, the subcommittee was always of the opinion that uh, these cases would have to be dealt with with extreme reservation and caution. The move of the player in these circumstances that do not fall under the regulatory exception uh, has to be not linked to football on the one side, but also there should not be the potential opportunity for the protective purpose of Article 19 to be circumvented in the future based on the jurisprudence that is being created. In line with these general observations, the subcommittee has last year accepted applications under very strict conditions where the minor player has fled his home country without the parents for humanitarian reasons, specifically related to his life or freedom being threatened. Indeed, the subcommittee considered that in such circumstances, the player could not be expected to return to his home country and was accordingly at least temporarily permitted to stay in the country of arrival. With regard to the specific humanitarian reasons that can be considered to fall under the refugee exception, the subcommittee has followed the reasons listed in the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention exclusively considers events occurring in the person's country of nationality as genuine reasons to define the term refugee and they are relevant, if they are relevant for political asylum law motives. Such motives exist if the person concerned is to be treated in violation of human rights in his country of origin due to his race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political views. Accordingly to what I have said now, the subcommittee has in principle exclusively recognized unaccompanied minor players who have been granted the status of a refugee in the narrow sense to meet the humanitarian reason requirement. While refugees in the narrow sense have a fear of persecution in their home countries, economic migrants, on the other hand, have chosen more or less to leave their home countries rather due to difficult economic circumstances. 
the economic migrants hope to settle in a new country that offers better employment opportunities and better living standards. The subcommittee has made very clear that they are not eligible to benefit from the exception. In addition to the Geneva Convention, refugee status, other forms of subsidiary protection have been accepted by the subcommittee, as long as the humanitarian reasons in the narrow sense were established. Occasionally, the subcommittee has also been asked to uh, deal with asylum seeker players still waiting for a decision of the national authority regarding their status. The subcommittee has only accepted in a very few cases such applications if it was convinced that this player would most likely be granted the Geneva Convention refugee or protected person status by the state authority in the future. All other cases have been rejected. Asylum seekers, so the subcommittee could in any case also be, only be registered for purely amateur clubs. The subcommittee made it also several times, emphasized several times that a more extensive application of the exception would forsake the purpose of Article 19 and render obsolete its entire ratio legis. Professional clubs and intermediaries um, could potentially abuse a broad interpretation for their football-related purposes. Now let's move to the second uh, exception based on jurisprudence. And uh, here um, I think we can say that the subcommittee accepted those cases where the player was moving without his parents to attend an acad academic and or school exchange program abroad and wants to play football as a social and side activity. In fact, the subcommittee has been of the strong opinion that studies provided by the school must be the sole driving force behind the exchange program. And the player must be fully encouraged to sign up for the exchange to enhance his academic and cultural knowledge. The club for which the player would register can therefore only be a purely amateur club. The subcommittee made also clear that an exchange student who plays football within the structure of a professional club or a professional academy can be, cannot be considered to participate in a leisure activity that accompanies his studies, regardless of whether he would be registered as an amateur or not. In order to avoid any possible and uh, attempt of illicit or convention of the regulations, um, it must undoubtedly be established that the move of the minor without his parents is for very specific academic reasons, as I have explained, and not to some extent motivated by the football activity of the uh, club during that program. Finally, in accordance with the jurisprudence of the subcommittee, the duration of the uh, registration for the player was limited to one year until the player turns 18 or until the end of the program. Overall, it, the subcommittee deemed that uh, this provides a balanced approach that takes into consideration uh, not only the minor's interest in studying abroad and play football, in his leisure time, but also ensuring that the exception is not used by third parties as a way to circumvent the spirit of the rules on the protection of minors. Corresponding to the increased uh, number of applications that we received and dealt with, there have been a lot of decisions issued. In uh, 2018, almost 4,000 decisions have been rendered. And as you can see from the graph, the vast majority has been accepted. Over 87% and only less than 13% has been rejected after careful analysis of our services and the subcommittee. What are the reasons for rejecting a minor application? 
If we first look at the humanitarian reasons, um, then we see that um, over 80% of the cases that had been rejected concerned economic migrants, and therefore did not meet the requirements established by the subcommittee. Exchange student exception, there we saw that players were participating in uh, programs that were at least partially motivated by football-related reasons. Or we saw that players wanted to uh, go in an exchange program and play at the same time for a club that had a link with a professional club. But there was a pathway into professional football. Or in some cases also that the duration of registration would be more than one year. If we look at the most popular exception, the parents move, not linked to football, there's some, it's very telling that in almost half of the cases, the application was rejected because the application was not complete. And this despite the fact that we have uh, about two, three years ago issued the minor application guide, which gives a lot of information to all the circumstances, what documents to submit. So here I see quite some potential to further increase the acceptance rate uh, when it comes to these applications. Then another big part, over 30%, um, concerns cases where the parents did not move, but instead delegated their parental authority to a third party. Finally, uh, the EU exception that was invoked in 9% of the total cases. Uh, there's two reasons why they were rejected. One is the insufficient academic education provided by the club, which was deemed very important by the subcommittee. And uh, the second one is that the football training offered was not in line with the highest national, national standard because the club was not categorized by its association uh, in the highest possible uh, category. I'm sure what you are most interested in is how long it takes from submitting an application until you have a decision. And there I think, despite having uh, more cases to deal with, um, the statistics, they don't lie and they tell you that per average it takes 17 days until a decision is rendered. If no additional documents are required, you have a decision with one week. And if additional documents are required, like it is the case, in uh, yeah, almost 40% of the, the, the applications, then it takes 24 days longer. So there's a huge delay caused by the fact that not all the documents are submitted at the beginning when the application initi is initiated. So what does CAS have to say about the matter? Um, actually, not that much last year. We only had one decision regarding the parents' move um, that concerned um, a case of a, a player going to Portugal and CAS just confirmed all the main principles that has been established in the case law before already. There was one decision taken on minors last year uh, by the CAS and the CAS confirmed that the EU exception should uh, be applicable to uh, transfer players with an EU passport from outside the EU to an EU country. This was the confirmation of a previous award in 2012. Now, to round up the overview of the registration process, um, we have a look at the ITC requests that were made outside the registration period and blocked, resulting in a validation exception. The numbers are more or less consistent. Out of the 356 validation exceptions that were created, in about one third, our, the override was never requested and the new club accepted to not register the player for the time being. In the other two thirds, um, there have been a vast majority of uh, cases that was accepted. What is te important to notice here is that the acceptance rate of the request for override to FIFA has increased by 28% compared to last year. So associations and club, they made a lot of progress in terms of uh,
doing their homework and putting all their information in TMS on time. Then uh, the ITC rejections, also refusal to grant international clearance. The, the number of cases um, is rather decreasing, the tendency, I would say. Uh, 70 of these uh, ITC rejections have been disputed in TMS, whereas 45 have been accepted. We have taken, out of these 70 cases, uh, 43 decisions, and uh, 27 cases have been resolved without a formal decision. In addition to that, we had obviously several cases that uh, were concerning players to be registered as amateurs outside of TMS. So the final point of my presentation is about uh, refugees, players moving for humanitarian reasons. In situations where their life or freedom is threatened in their home country, FIFA has a special procedure. FIFA wants to avoid that the former association or the authorities in the country of origin of the player become aware of the whereabouts of the player and uh, due to the ITC proceedings. Therefore, um, the association shall rather request FIFA to intervene instead of requesting the ITC from the former association. Since July, when this was more or less in place, we had to deal with a bit more than 70 cases. Um, and we will see how this develops in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Do we have any questions for Gaudens? Yes, I see one question in the front. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Gaudens, for your kind presentation. Uh, just one question. Uh, I would like to know where in the regulations it says that the maximum level of training is directly linked to the category of the club. Because if we ad admit and we <coughs> assume that only maximum level of training is given by category one clubs, we are excluding automatically all the clubs from category two, three, four, etc., and even those clubs that only uh, participate in under 18 competitions that do not have a senior team. Well, the regulations that talk about uh, football training of the highest national standard. And then basically it was considered by the subcommittee that this should correspond to the categorization and be equivalent, equivalent to the uh, categorization for training competition purposes. Because you could not at the one hand say that for minor applications a club would be of the highest national standard. On the other side for training compensation it would be kind of uh, categories four, for example, so no training compensation would have to be paid. That's why it has been implemented like this. Okay, one more question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I would have asked the same question, and I, I hear now your explanation, but it's kind of strange to me. If you look to the jurisprudence of the, of the European Court, training compensation is connected with the training costs. And not with, the, with the, the quality of the training. So I don't understand your answer. Well, as you might understand, it's very difficult, for example, for FIFA to assess the training provided by a club. So it was deemed by the subcommittee that the association is much closer to that, and therefore they have to assess anyway their uh, training clubs, and at least indirectly the investment in, in the training of young players is probably corresponding to the, the, the quality of the training as well. This is the only objective criteria that the subcommittee could find. Yes, but for example, in the Netherlands, we have an objective system with regard to the quality of the, the, the training of the clubs in the Netherlands, and that is not taken into account. So that's strange. Well, I mean, we have to apply uh, these rules worldwide, and that was uh, the, the criterion that was, was, was chosen. And I think, it, more or less for me, it seems to be a, a fair approach. Okay, we will have to move on from here. Thank you very much, Gaudens, for your presentation. And... Now, speaking of the Netherlands, I'm happy to announce the next speaker, Matthias Wittagen, 
group leader in the player status who will talk to you about solidarity mechanism and training compensation. Thank you very much, Maya. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the next topic on the agenda is solidarity mechanism and training compensation disputes. Before speaking about the actual disputes, um, I will firstly briefly um, touch on the regulatory basis for solidarity contribution and training compensation, as well as um, deal with some statistics related to new claims received as well as decisions passed by the decision-making bodies of FIFA. Then I will address three interesting decisions of um, decision-making bodies of FIFA as well as the subsequent awards of the Court of Arbitration for Sport before closing the topic with some conclusions. As you all probably know, um, according to Article 20 of the regulations, training compensation is payable whenever a player is registered for the first time as a professional and each time he transfers uh, internationally as a professional until the end of the season of his 23rd birthday. More details about the calculation and the application of uh, training compensation can be found in Annex 4 of the regulations. According to Article 21 of the regulations, um, the solidarity contribution is a proportion of the transfer fee paid for the international transfer of a professional player and is supposed to be paid to um, all the clubs that have been uh, involved in the training of the player when he was young. Annex 5 of the regulations then contains more detailed rules on the calculation and the payment of such contribution. And furthermore, Annex 6 of uh, the regulations was added in uh, the first, as of the 1st of October 2015 and establishes that as of that date uh, all claims related to solidarity contribution and training compensation must be submitted and managed through the transfer matching system. This was a big improvement and led to a more um, effective way of case handling and you can find the exact procedure in Annex 6 of the regulations. Besides providing for a more effective way of case handling, um, the introduction of the claim step in TMS also led to a significant increase in the number of uh, claims received by player status department. After a small increase in the year 2016, which was the first full year of dealing with claims uh, via TMS, you can see that clearly in 2017 and 2018 there was a major increase in new claims being lodged um, and especially related to the solidarity contribution. When it comes to the number of decisions passed uh, during the same period, you can see that the peak was in the year 2016. And this was caused by the fact that um, the pending so-called paper cases that we were still dealing with uh, were submitted to the deciding bodies during that year in addition to cases being decided in TMS. And the growing difference between the number of claims received uh, and the decisions passed during the years 2017 and 2018 is mainly due to the fact that uh, more and more cases are being settled between the parties. Now let's move to the jurisprudence. Uh, the first case concerns a dispute related to the solidarity mechanism. Um, the DRC decision is published on FIFA.com and you can find the CAS award on the website of CAS. In this case, um, the player Peter Odenwingi was trained by PFA in Nigeria. Uh, for about one and a half year when he was 16 and 17 years old. And in January 2014, Cardiff City from Wales and Stoke City from England concluded a transfer agreement for the, uh, the exchange of services of the two players. First of all, the player Odenwingi went from Cardiff to Stoke and the player Jones went the other way around from Stoke to Cardiff. While both players still had a valid employment contract with their respective club, no transfer compensation was paid by either of the clubs. At DRC level, PFA claimed solidarity contribution from Stoke based on Odin Wingy's transfer, arguing that the fact that no transfer compensation was paid does not mean that the, the transfer did not have any economic value. Stoke, on the other hand, uh, argued that there was no monetary exchange and therefore no solidarity contribution had to be paid uh, to PFA. The DRC, in its decision, concluded that indeed an exchange of players had taken place and that the sporting qualities of those players had a certain economic value on the football market to which the solidarity mechanism applies. Now, in order to determine the economic value of the players, the DRC followed its own jurisprudence and took into account 
the transfer compensation paid for the previous transfers of both players. And DRC found that the average of those amounts was um, the most accurate value of the player services at the moment of the exchange and could serve as the basis to calculate the solidarity contribution due to, PF to PFA. And finally, Stoke was ordered to pay around 34,000 British pounds um, to PFA. Stoke did not agree with the decision and appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And the sole arbitrator at CAS level considered the following. Uh, first of all, an exchange of registration rights is at its essence two sales contracts, um, where the rights on offer for the transfer by a club constitute the consideration for uh, the transfer of rights associated with another player to that same club. And based on several um, economic considerations, the sole arbitrator held that it is not possible to conclude that the rights associated with the players at the time of the exchange did not have any value. Otherwise, there was no reason for the transaction in the first place. And in the case of an exchange where one player's registration rights are exchanged for another's and no additional compensation is paid by any of the clubs, this transfer price must necessarily be the same for both players. And finally, the sole arbitrator concluded that in absence of any additional information known at the time of the exchange, the methodology used by the DRC appears to be adequate. And so the appeal was dismissed. The next case concerns a training compensation dispute. Um, the amateur player Tony Jim was trained by Liège in Belgium from the 1st of July 2008 until the 28th of April 2014. Later, on the 25th of July 2014, the player signed his first professional contract with Porto in Portugal, where he was eventually registered as a professional on the 10th of November 2014. And following this first registration as a professional of the player, Liège filed a claim for training compensation in front of the DRC. First of all, the DRC in its decision established that the special provisions of Article 6 of Annex 4 of the regulations apply to the case as the player moved from one association to another within the European Union. And following paragraph three of this article, um, the Belgian club had to prove that it had offered the player a professional contract, or if that was not the case, that at least it had shown um, a genuine interest in keeping the services of the player. Now, the Belgian club claimed that it had indeed offered the player a professional contract via registered mail, but that the player never collected the letter containing the offer. Nevertheless, the Belgian club believed that it had complied with its obligation. Porto, on the other hand, argued that uh, Liège only offered the player a contract in order to secure its entitlement to training compensation. The DRC, um, in its decision, emphasized that the fulfillment of the formal requirements in order to be entitled to training compensation without the real intention to keep the services of a player should not be protected. And the DRC pointed out that Liège was well aware that the player um, did not actually receive the document as he did not collect it. However, uh, the DRC found that the Belgian club failed to prove that it had a genuine interest in the services of the player and therefore rejected the claim. And to no surprise, Liège appealed the decision to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. On CAS level, the panel confirmed that a club is entitled to training compensation uh, if it offers the player a professional contract or if it can otherwise justify its entitlement to training compensation. And CAS emphasized that uh, the common purpose of these two alternatives is to make the payment of training compensation subject to the condition that a club really wanted to keep the services of the player. And only if the club sincerely pursued this goal, um, the free movement of the player may be impeded by an automatic price tag. When considering the actual question whether Liège had offered the player a contract, um, the panel took into account the following circumstances. First of all, it questioned whether the player or his parents had actually received uh, the offer, the document containing the offer, as it had been stored at the post office after the delivery failed. The contract offer was not signed by a representative of the club, and as such, the panel found that this could not be considered a binding offer. Furthermore, the sports director of the club had informed the player at the beginning of the season 2013-2014 that um, he was basically not part of the future sportive plans of the club. And during that season, 13-14, the player was demoted from the under-19 team to the under-17 team of the club. The player then, following these events, decided to use his right to be deregistered from the club 
Um, and it appeared to the panel that the club was informed of the deregistration of the player and uh, sent him basically the contract offer on the same day. So the panel found that Liège failed to take any proactive stance vis-à-vis uh, -vis the player to retain his services. Once the documents containing the offer were returned to it, it did not take any action. And so the panel concluded that the only motivation for the contract offer was actually to receive training compensation. And the panel decided to dismiss the appeal. The last case also concerns training compensation. Again, an amateur player, Indy Bonen, trained by Genk, again in Belgium, from the 1st of July 2010 until the 30th of June 2014. About a year after leaving the Belgian club on the 1st of August 2015, the player signed a scholarship agreement with Manchester United in England, where he was then registered as a professional on the 4th of September 2015. And following this registration, the Belgian club filed a claim for training compensation in front of the DRC. And again, the DRC established that uh, the special provisions of Article 6 of Annex 4 of the regulations apply to the case as the player moved from Belgium to England within the European Union. And the Belgian club claimed that it was not in a position to offer the player a professional contract due to national law. Um, in Belgium, clubs are forbidden to offer employment contracts to players below the age of 16. However, the Belgian club found that it had shown sufficient interest in, uh, in keeping the services of the player in order to be entitled to training compensation, while Manchester United obviously argued the opposite. The subcommittee of the DRC recognized that Genk was not in a position to offer the player a professional contract due to national law, but agreed with Manchester United that the Belgian club had not submitted any documentation um, demonstrating basically a proactive attitude towards the player to show him that it was counting on him for the future. And consequently, the subcommittee of the DRC rejected the claim. And again, the Belgian club appealed the decision to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. The panel, first of all, uh, did not agree with Genk that there is some sort of Belgian exception that um, releases Belgian clubs from complying with the requirements of Article 6, Paragraph 3 of Annex 4 of the regulations. Belgium is a member of the European Union, and uh, the fact that Belgian clubs are prohibited from offering a player a professional contract <coughs> does not mean that they cannot justify otherwise that they were actually <laughs> entitled to training compensation. Um, when considering the question whether Genk had proven that it is entitled to training compensation, even though it did not offer the player a professional contract, the CAS panel pointed out that the burden of proof is rather high in such cases and took into account the following circumstances. The evaluation report submitted by Genk, the last one dated December 2013, do not prove that Genk took a proactive attitude towards the player to show him that it was counting on his services after the season 2013-2014. And the fact that uh, Genk's training facilities and education are of, of a high standard does not address the player's specific situation. Furthermore, Genk submitted various press articles from 2015 and 2016, but the panel found that such articles were not relevant as they do not um, provide any evidence of Genk's intention to keep the player at the moment when he announced his departure back in April 2014. So all in all, the panel held that Gang did not demonstrate that it took all the necessary measures to persuade the player to stay. And when he announced his departure back in April 2014, it did not contact the player, did not send him any letter, and it seems to have simply accepted his decision to leave the club. And therefore, the appeal was dismissed. Now, what are the conclusions that we can draw from these cases? First of all, players who are exchanged by means of one transfer agreement without further payment of a transfer compensation do have an economic value, which can be most accurately calculated by taking the average of the previous transfer compensations paid for the transfers of the players. In so-called EU cases, contract offers must be made um, in a genuine attempt to retain the services of the player. And even if a club is not in a position to offer the player a professional contract, it can still justify its entitlement to training compensation by taking a proactive stance towards the player to show him that it is really counting on his services for the future. However, the burden of proof in such cases, as pointed out by Kaas, is rather high. Thank you very much. This was it.
Thank you, Matthias. Do you have any questions? Oh, yes. Okay, we're gonna take three questions and then we will have to continue. So, we start up there. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. I am Américo Espaliargas, I'm from Brazil. Uh, my question does not specifically regard the cases presented, but whether FIFA is looking at updating the, trend for the training compensation table. Thank you. As far as I know, this is indeed uh, part of the, of the reviews that are currently being discussed in the, in the task force. Um, as you probably know, the table of, of amounts uh, applicable to each category has not changed ever since the, the entering into force in 2001. So um, yeah, I think this is part of the discussions currently and uh, is being looked at, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Frank Happy from Cameroon. My question is what I just asked uh, some few hours ago when we opened uh, the symposium. The delay in the payment of training compensation on solidarity mechanism, the procedures are too long Fine, if in cases where you're transferring Ronaldo or, or Neymar, or, it can be understood. But for us African clubs, at times the amounts are as petty as 2,000 euros, 1,500 euros. And the club, since there is no penalty attached to the payment of such compensation or such solidarity mechanism, because we don't have any direct contact, contact with them, you know that in that case, most times, the players move from our club to a foreign club, and now it's from that foreign club or foreign association that is moving to the third club. We don't get paid on time. At times, we can wait two years for 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 euros. What can we do? What can you do with that? Since for transfer fees, there can be penalties attached to default of payment or delay payment, why is there not, no pressure or measure to... Uh, to expedite, to, to swifter the payment of training compensation and solidarity mechanism? That's my question. Yeah, I understand your concern, obviously. Um, we are well aware that there is a, quite a lot of clubs that are not um, basically fulfilling their obligations, payment of solidarity contribution or payment of training compensation. I think the first measure that has been taken was the implementation of Article 24 bis which uh, my colleague Marco will address um, in a few minutes. These, uh, this article is actually also applicable to uh, decisions in cases regarding training compensation and solidarity contribution. So like this, hopefully we can put some more pressure on the clubs to actually uh, fulfill their obligations. And yeah, the other point is, I think it was addressed already in the morning, um, that FIFA is currently looking into the possibility of establishing a clearinghouse, which would hopefully also um, improve basically um, and probably also make the payment of, so, of those fees faster than, uh, than in the current situation. Okay, one last question, please. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Gonzalo Almeida, attorney at law from Portugal. Um, well, uh, as, you, as you know, we, we used to uh, bother you constantly with this training compensation and solidarity contribution claims and uh, what I wanted to share with you is more a concern than actually uh, place any question and end up perhaps with the suggestion that you may consider implementing. Um, as we all know, um, since 2001, training compensation and solidarity contribution are very important financial instruments to assist um, these uh, clubs that participate actively in the education and training of young players. So this is very important at a financial, uh, from a financial perspective for them. Now, uh, in the field, what uh, we face now with TMS is that most of these clubs, and this is the reality in Portugal, but I could give you other examples, uh, Brazil, for instance, most of these clubs, third league, fourth league clubs, who actually have an important role in the training and education of players, their access to the TMS is very limited. Let's, let's just give you a couple of examples. Either the club's owner is not around and he owns the office keys, 
and so no one accesses the system, or the TMS manager is on holidays, and what happens uh, in the meantime? And the people who have access to the TMS, most of them in this case, I'm not talking about the first leak, I'm talking about third and fourth leak, they don't even speak any of the four official languages of FIFA. And this brings us a problem um, that as lawyers we're facing in order to avoid uh, uh, time limits expiring, which has happened recently quite often. So that said, my suggestion is for you to consider the need for us as lawyers to uh, be aware of what's going on in a certain procedure in which uh, we have attached a power of attorney. I mean, we could have access to TMS in this specific case to upload documents, not that much, okay, but at least perhaps have access to the status of the procedure would help a lot. Otherwise, instead of these small clubs having the solidarity contribution and the training compensation as tools, financial important tools to assist them, the TMS is in a way, making things harder for them to claim their legitimate rights. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. I think uh, Kimberly Morris is also here in the room who has heard uh, the suggestion, and I think it's rather something for her department to, uh, to think about, or not. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So then now we will continue with the next presentation of Player States Department is Mr. Mario Flores Chemor, Group Leader Player Status, who will talk about eligibility and change of association. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Maya. Um, thank you all for being here and also from the people following us in FIFA.com. Um, as I said, Maya said, I'm going to take you through the eligibility and change of association matters, which although it seems quite straightforward at the beginning, it might raise of some interesting questions. Now, this is what your 10 to 12 minutes, if Maya allows it, will look like. Uh, first, we will go with the principles. As you know, every system needs to start with certain principles. So we will go with the principles of eligibility, after which I will take you through the exception to the principle, which is contained in Article 7. Thereafter, I will briefly discuss a very interesting CASA award, and at the end, I will just show you some figures. Okay, so we start with the principles. Whoa. Okay, so the first principle is that any person holding a permanent nationality that is not dependent on residence is eligible to participate with a representative of a member association. What does it mean? First, that the nationality needs to be permanent. Why is this the case? Around the years of 2007, uh, FIFA started to realize that certain national associations were issuing the so-called uh, residence passports, which were providing the same rights as a normal nationality, that, however, were subject, which validity was subject to the person being resident of that country. So in order to avoid this, this amendment was established in the, in the regulations in, uh, uh, there. I mean, it's important to state that these regulations are the ones governing the application of the statutes. Now, the second one is that any player who has participated in an official competition on any kind of football of any category is not allowed or eligible to participate with another member association. Now, two important uh, points are, uh, can be drawn from these, uh, from these principles. One is what, if, what is an official competition? When the official competition is defined as, as that that is organized either by FIFA or by a confederation, meaning not friendly games. The most uh, common example of this is the case of Diego Costa, who participated in a friendly match with Brazil. However, this does not hinder his eligibility to play for Spain. The second point is what is an A match? I think we all, with uh, using some of common sense, can determine what is an A international match. However, this is not well defined. Well, you can find it in the regulations governing international matches, and it's defined as a match in which both teams field their first team. In uh, simplest words, is those competitions which do not, do not have a limit of age. Now, we go to the legal basis, and we are talking of two general possibilities when holding a nationality. One, that you have the nationality since birth 
or two, that you acquire a new nationality during the course of your life. Now, when we're talking about nationality since birth, of course, we are facing with two possibilities, which is the one that is the so-called use and guineas, which is that if you have parents of a specific country, you are a national of that country, and the second one they use solely, which is if you were born in the territory, then you are the nationality of that territory. Now, in this respect, Article 6 of the regulations uh, define when, as play, when a player that has a single passport can play for several teams, the most common being the British passport that allows you to play for four different teams. Uh, this is in Article 6. But what is more relevant for the present presentation is the acquisition of a nationality. Now, if you acquire a nationality, there are extra requirements that you need to meet in order to be able to participate with a member association. The first one being that you were born in the territory, the second one, that your biological parents are from that territory. The third one, the so-called granny rule, which is that your grandparents are, uh, were born there. And the, finally, the five-year rule, which is that the player has lived continuously during five years after the age of 18. Now, it is important to state that these, uh, these uh, requirements are not cumulative, but at le if at least one is fulfilled, then the player who acquired the nationality will be entitled to participate with the member association that he or she wishes to. Okay, now having gone through the principle, let's go to the exception to the principle. As you know, there are always exceptions. And the exception on this one is in one of 7D. Now, in the recent years, the players at the committee faced with scenarios where there was a player who, as a child, moved to another country, who had lived there for, I don't know, six, seven years, that, however, would not meet any of the uh, exceptions contained in Article 7D, because, as I mentioned before, the five-year rule is, in principle, only as of the age of 18. So facing with this kind of a scenarios in a, a bit of a sense of fairness, the player status committee decided that there could be an exception to this general rule, which is the 7D exception, which is if a player has lived in a certain country, even before the age of 18, during at least five years, then his or he or she could apply to the player status committee to request for an exception to the acquisition of the new nationality uh, rule and therefore be eligible to play. Now, what is what the uh, uh, Bureau of the Peer Status Committee analyzes in these kind of cases? That the move of the player was not for reasons linked to football, basically. If this can be established, then the exception will be granted. Now, it's important to state that is the burden of the, F the, of the association to uh, provide us with a burden of proof. Now, let's go, okay. Let's go with the change of association. Now, as I mentioned, uh, there is a, a one possibility to change association. Now, there are three basic principles, which is one, it can only be done one time. You can only change association for one time. Two, the second requirement is that the player has not played in an A, an official competition with the A team. And three, that at the time that he played for, at the time that he played, for a youth team of another association in an official competition, he or she already had the nationality at the time of that match. Now, there is an exception to this uh, general rule, which is if there is a permanent loss of nationality, an unwilling loss of nationality due to a governmental decision. Okay, now these are the principles then which we work with, and then we can go to the uh, interest cast award. Unfortunately, the cast award is confidential, so I will not be naming any names or anything. However, from the facts, maybe you can imply to whom I'm talking about. We have a player that is uh, born in country A, however, that his father is for country B, and he holds both nationalities. He goes, and when he's around 21 years old, he goes and plays 17 minutes for an official match with a representative of country A. Thereafter, unfortunately, the player is not called up again. Of course, he's also, in principle, the national of the country B association, so he says, well, I want to change association. So he sends a request for change association to FIFA. Now, if you follow the principles that I just mentioned, of course, the first straight answer is, this is not possible. Why? Because the player already participated in an official competition with the A team of country A. Then, in application of the relevant rules, the viewer of the PSE rejected the change of association. Now, the case was, of course, appealed to CAS. 
The case is quite complex. I will not stop many. It has the issues of standing to sue, of standing to be sued. So I will really focus on the core the argument of the player, which is the most important one in my view, which is the alleged violation of a personality rights. So the player was saying, on the basis of Article 27 and 28 of the Swiss Civil Code, this decision and the applicability of this rule violate my personality rights because it doesn't allow me to participate with my home country, well, not my home country, but with the country which, on which I am a national. There were two key arguments in this by the panel. First, where the violation of the personality rights occur, this, did actually this happen, and what is the limit of FIFA in organizing or in self-regulating or imposing its own rules on eligibility. Now, the panel, in a very interesting decision, went first to analyze that the violation of the personality rights needs to be objective and needs to meet certain thresholds. And moreover, it is also in applying precedent, they say, well, yes, personality rights specifically apply to the world sport. And this is basically twofold. One, it covers the right of the player to participate in a competitive level with fellow teammates and against teammates of the same level. And two, it needs to write the, player the, 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 the right to the player of developed in a sporting activity, either from an amateur perspective or from a pro professional perspective. And therefore, it needs to allow the player to, participate, to, be a, uh, to follow in a sporting uh, activity. Now, the panel in applying these principles to the sport decided that in this particular case, these two objectives of the personality were not violated. Why? Well, first, in regarding the equal participation, he said, well, the players is still eligible to participate in country A. Nothing prevents that the coach of country A will call him and then he will be able to appear for this uh, country. And second, his sporting activity is not hindered because he currently has an employment contract with a club who is paying his salary and therefore his economic existence or his economic uh, follow cannot uh, be, uh, is not hindered, sorry. So using these principles, so as I said, this is very, very, a uh, very basic uh, summary. Then the, the side of the panel decided to dismiss the appeal and then confirm the decision of the Bureau. Uh, this is uh, basically the limits. Also, it's important to state that even though the decision was confirmed, I believe that from the CASA word, there is an implicit argument saying, well, you FIFA, yes, you can self-regulate yourself. However, there are limits, and those limits are the ones that touch what one could call the public policy of Swiss being FIFA, Swiss association. So, for example, if the panel would have found that the violation, that the rules violated the personality rights of the player, well, the outcome could have been different. So there are limits to the uh, possibility of FIFA to self-regulate. Uh, well, finally, and just some quick figures, then in the past 2018, we passed more than 80 decisions regarding eligibility and change of association. And as you or the people who are involved in this kind of, uh, of cases, you know that these have to be dealt with swiftly and with a very tight schedule. Uh, that would be it. I think I managed the time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Questions? No. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have time for questions because we are running a little bit late, so we will skip the question session and we will run immediately to Marco Mesqua, Group Leader Player Status. Thank you, Maya. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I will go a little bit fast because of the time constraints. I will be talking about two subjects today, overview payable matters and the recently introduced article 24Bs of the regulations. First, let's put overdue payable matters into context. As you can imagine, the discontent of both players and clubs regarding the constant malpractice regarding overdue payables is palpable. And we receive a significant number of contractual disputes in relation to this topic. That is why after extensive consultation with the stakeholders of the football committee, at that time, the FIFA Executive Committee approved several amendments to our regulations, which included the introduction of Article 12b. The objective was clear. It was to aim at the protection of the financial rights of both players and, pro of both players and clubs, and to aim to ensure that clubs comply with their financial contractual obligations. This provision entered into force since 1st March 2015, in accordance to FIFA Circular 1468. In order for Article 12b to be applicable, there's two formal requirements, two conditions that need to be there. 
a delay of due payment for more than 30 days without a prima facie contractual basis. Without a prima facie contractual basis means that at first sight, while looking at the documentation at the basis of the claim, there is no apparent valid reason to justify the non-payment of the amount. And also, we need a written default notice providing the club at least 10 days to remedy the default. It's important to note that this default notice has to be sent after the delay of due payment for more than 30 days. Well, why, why Article 12b is a little bit special? Because once it's applicable, it grants the possibility to our, to our deciding bodies to impose sanctions in case a club is found in breach of this article. So what are the possible sanctions? It consists warning, reprimand, a fine, and a ban from registering any new players, either nationally or internationally. The imposition of these sanctions follows certain principles. First, the most important, the wide scope that the deciding authority has while choosing one of these sanctions. Okay? They may take into account several factors. Which ones? The actual overdue amount, the particular circumstances of the case, and if, for example, if the club had been found before in breach of this article. There's two other principles in accordance with the wording of the, of the multi-mentioned article. These sanctions may be applied cumulatively, so we could apply or both or two of those, and a repeated offense will be considered as an aggravating circumstance, and hence it will lead to a more severe penalty. Just two notes very quick regarding the uh, sanction of a ban from registering new players. The article provides for the possibility for the actual execution of the ban to be suspended. However, the club that infringe will be subject to a probation period. This means that, okay, the execution, in fact, will not be done, but if the club commits another offense during the period of probation period, the, the actual suspension will be revoked and the ban will be enforced. It's also worth pointing out that a ban on the basis of 12 bis that has, in fact, come into force will not be lifted, even if the amounts are paid subsequently. In order to protect the financial rights of both players and clubs, the deciding bodies need to pass fast decisions, hence the treatment of overdue payables as fast-track proceedings. This is allowed by a system that allows us, the administration, direct communication with the judges, and that allows us to submit these cases on a weekly basis. Me, personally, I feel a little bit proud that at this moment, the average from a receipt of a complete claim until the notification of a final decision is nine weeks. So it's all worth pointing out that Article 12 bis constitute 8% of all PS, PSC and DRC proceedings with the exclusion of protection of minors. Let's look at some figures really quickly. This first part of the graphic refers to PSC claims. That means uh, claims related to overdue transfer fees, club versus club. We receive a total of 77 potential OP claims. Basically, that number of 19% refers that our claims finally not meeting overdue payable requirements. We missed one of the formal requirements. The 13% close can seem like a quite high number. That is because of the burden to pay advance of costs in proceedings in front of the prior status committee. And that 15% of ongoing investigation is because we still take into account the numbers of the claims that we received in November and December of 2018. As you can see, the numbers relating to claims relating to overdue players remuneration is quite high. There's almost 200 potential OP claims. Here you can see that only 3% are close by not having a complete claim. That is why this is because relating to employment-related disputes, Proceedings are free of charge. There's no burden to pay advance of costs. And 36% of these cases are decided upon. Let's look quickly about number percentages regarding sanctions. This covers approximately the 350 decisions that we have passed in relation to overdue payable matters. In particular, 370 sanctions, because they can be applied cumulatively. So certain sanctions have two, certain decisions have two sanctions. As you can see, the most common uh, sanction applied by our deciding bodies is fine. And it's worth noting that from this 16%, approximately 40% of the bans enter into force. Uh, just a quick note relating a uh, decision in relation to overdue payables from last year. Just as a background, the DRC had previously imposed a ban. However, the execution was suspended 
and the club Kayseri Sport was subject to a probation period of 18 months. Then the Bureau of the PSC found out that the club had in fact committed another infringement on the basis of Article 12 bis during the probation period, during these 18 months. With that in mind, the Bureau lifted the suspension, revoked the suspension in fact, and executed the ban. The club appealed the decision. In essence, the club argued that the sanction was disproportionate since they paid the amount only three days after the decision of the Bureau. The award was good for us since it confirmed in full the, deci the decision of the Bureau. It took into account that the alleged technical problems of the bank do not per se exclude the responsibility of not fulfilling, not fulfilling the relevant deadline. It also pointed out that the formal requirements of Article 12 bis were there. And uh, most important, it recalled this principle of the wide discretion that the deciding authority has while imposing these sanctions. And uh, what is for me the most important part is that the panel considered that it's, in fact there's no room to an analyze the proportionality of the lifting of suspension because the wording of the article explicitly mentions that, that the suspension will be lifted. Now, let's move to our second topic, the recently introduced Article 24 bis of the regulations. Well, sure, we can all agree that it's really good to have a monetary decision in your favor. However, as a matter of fact, this is only advantageous if the decision is complied with and you receive your money, or if there is a fast and smooth enforcement process. That is why, in the context of the discussions regarding the narrow issues of the regulations, the stakeholders agreed, in principle, in this topic of execution of monetary decisions. Why? In order to strengthen the dispute resolution procedure. Basically, Article 24b is the new provision that started, that entered into force since 1st June 2018, and it grants the deciding bodies, the DRC, the PSC, the single judge, and the DRC judge, the powers to impose sanctions on both players and clubs should a monetary decision not be complied with. Okay? So what does it mean? It means that the deciding body would not only decide as to the substance of the case, it will also already there in the decision decide upon the possible sanctions in case one of the parties does not follow the instruction to pay the amount. The objective of this article is quite clear. It's the prevention from non-compliance of monetary decisions. Where does it work? It works under the framework of disputes relating to transfer agreements, club versus club. It works on the scope of disputes related to contracts, so player versus club. It relates, it also will work on disputes related to training compensation and solidarity mechanism where, article, where this article applies. And this is, I think at this moment it's worth pointing out that since the article is both applicable to players and clubs, the article envisages different consequences depending on which party is not following the decision, the, the decision itself. So in case a player not following the monetary part of paying, again, it, the decision uh, conceives that the player will get a restriction on playing official matches. If it's a club, it will be a ban. Evidently, in order for the enforcement process to apply, we need a final and binding decision. And it's also important, in my view, to highlight that it's not merely a punitive remedy, since in case the amounts are in fact paid, the restriction or the ban imposed will be lifted immediately once these amounts are paid. Just uh, as a quick note in practice, so far, our experience is quite limited. Why? Because this article has only been applicable to very few decisions so far. And at the moment, we don't have a case appealed with this topic. That would be all on my part. I remain at your disposal in case time of questions. That's not true. I will not remain at your disposal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Marco, so what we will do now is we will do a very short break of five to ten minutes and then please be back because Kimberly will be next 
in Qing will have a very interesting topic on the clearinghouse and possible change of solidarity and training. So short break of five to ten minutes and then we continue. Thank you.
So please, everybody, can we start to sit down again? We are a little bit out of time, so we would really appreciate if you could start to get into your seats. Otherwise, Kimberly will start to speak. Yes. Ladies, gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to get back on track. So I'm going to go through this presentation in 20 minutes so that we can go back to the time frame and, and make sure that you get your flights and do what you need to do. A good afternoon to you all. Um, I would also just like to reiterate uh, hello to those who are watching us on FIFA.com and to tell you that all of the slides that I'm going to be showing you, indeed all of the slides that you've seen today, will be distributed to you. Okay, So if I go quite quickly, I do have a tendency to speak very fast. Just Raise your hands, I'll do my best to slow down. But please don't worry if you miss anything on the slides because you'll be getting everything sent to you, okay? Particularly with respect to some of the data that I'll be showing you. So, TMS. Um, for those of you who are aware and know, the primary objective of TMS is to simplify the process of international player transfers, right? It's to improve uh, transparency and the flow of information and to bring credibility and integrity to the international transfer system. There are other objectives that you see of TMS, certainly the protection of minors. And the other objective that I'm going to be talking to is to ensure that clubs who train players, as we've heard a number of people mention today, are properly compensated. So how do we do all these things? I have a fantastic team. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, tell you a little bit about them. We are not all lawyers. In fact, the smallest uh, group of us are lawyers, the TMS compliance. I have a team of people who are developers on site, the engine room of TMS. They manage the technology. They ensure its stability and security. I also have a group of people who are training and support people. Some of you in the room who are TMS users will be aware of them and will have had the opportunity to get advice and consultation from them. We also do quite a bit of teaching and training to our user community. This is something we take very seriously and is important, of course, helping people comply with the regulations. And finally, I have a great group of guys who do data and reports, and a lot of the information I'm going to be showing you is due to the work that they do. Our reports are all available for free download at fifatms.com. We published yesterday the Big Five report, and earlier uh, this year um, in January, the GTM, which shows all of the transfer activity for 2018. Uh, we also published this year for the first time a GTM in connection with professional women transfers. That also has some very interesting data. We also produce um, a report on intermediaries each year in November. So, like Erica, uh, my team is very diverse, um, multidisciplinary, and multicultural. So, international transfers. This is a snapshot of what we've seen from this year um, in terms of what we do in the system. You heard people earlier talk today about the ability to process minor applications in TMS as well as the ability to process claims in TMS. And the numbers here on the right-hand side of the, call of, the, of the slide show you the figures that have been processed in 2018. The volume of transfers increasing over an eight-year period, peaking this year at over 16,500, almost a 40% increase in growth in the number of transfers. Okay. This is the number of FIFA member associations and clubs who are involved in the transfer systems. And we see this year as well, for the first year, almost 1,000 um, transfers of professional women players in TMS. We expect this to grow. The timing of transfers, registration periods are open throughout the year. There are, of course, three peak registration periods. These are in January, in July, and in August. And 62% of the activity happens during this time. This is a snapshot of a day, one day. In fact, a day uh, at the end of this month, on the 31st of January. This shows you that users, because of the different time frames across the globe, use the system at all times. There's a peak in the activity between about 6 to about 7 p.m. on the 31st of January. The system is something um, that we have increased users on the system all the time. We do run load tests on the system, and we now know that over 600 users can be on the system at once, processing their transfers in under 30 minutes. Happily, there's a decrease in the number of tickets that we receive, that the training and support team receives. So this means for us that our training and e-learning is working and that clubs and associations are getting better in terms of what they need to do in the transfer matching system. 
Also, we run heavy compliance during the peak registration periods. There's also a decrease in clubs who enter counter instructions and member associations who have to uh, confirm players. So again, we're very happy with this activity. Um, increased user uh, knowledge and decreased uh, compliance or non-compliance with the system. Transfers in the money. Uh, you all read in the media about the big transfers and the big transfer fees. It's important to recognize that if we look at the year as a whole, that 65% of transfers that happen are out of contract. This means that all the money sits in the transfers which are permanent. So in 2018, 6.2 billion US dollars happened in only 12.5% of the transfers. The figure that you see on the far uh, right hand side, the out of contract, this is, of course, represents the big transfer that happened by way of a buyout clause earlier this year. The Neymar transfer is where that money sits. So again, we see most of the money happening on the permanent side and some on the loan side as well. This is what happens in a confederation view. So when you think about the money, it's important to recognize that all the money is sitting primarily in UEFA. Although in 2018, we saw that the AFC um, Saudi Arabia as a member association and the clubs in Saudi Arabia did do heavy spending in 2018, but this is how it breaks down at a confederation level. The volume, the value of transfers, again, increased. Huge increase, right? We looked at an eight-year period earlier. I showed you a slide where I said that it was a 40% increase in the number of transfers, but look at the money. There's a 142% increase in the money compared to almost a 40% growth in the transfers. So the money is exponential and certainly increasing. And again, we see a small figure, which I mentioned earlier in response to somebody's question this morning, about half a million dollars, which is spent on the professional women's transfers. And we certainly expect this to grow as well. This is drilling down a little bit on club spending and receipts. Again, this is something um, that you'll find in the GTM report. Interesting to see for you that really there's a broad span of how people spend money. How do clubs spend money? There are clubs who spend less than, uh, than 10,000, and there are clubs that spend more than 50 million on their player transfers in one particular year. Okay? So there's 31 clubs who spent more than an aggregate of 50 million. So that's not 50 million on one transfer, that's sort of all together in all of the transfers that the clubs do. And it accounts for more than 53.3% of global spending. 28 of those 31 clubs are from UEFA, I'm sorry, are from the big five, with the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, and Wales also following. So again, important to re realize and to remember that the spending and the money is concentrated in the hands of a certain number of clubs. Um, in terms of the clubs who are receiving the money, 25 of the 36 clubs receiving over 50 million are from the big five as well, and then the remaining associations, as you see there. So remember I told you that the Big Five report came out yesterday. There was a FIFA media release in connection with that and certainly it's available for you to have a look at. But this just shows you again how it looks in the winter and in the summer and in the money uh, that sits in both areas when we're talking about spending. Okay. But I think it's the last bullet point that I have on the slide here is perhaps what's the most interesting to show that 67.8% of the total worldwide spend has been from the Big Five clubs since we started tracking this information in 2011. Uh, TMS also collects information on intermediaries, otherwise known as agents. Um, and in terms of that data, we collect um, information about who has been using agents. So is it the engaging club, is it the releasing club, or is it the player? This shows you um, the global figures since 2013 when we started collecting this information about who uses intermediaries and where those intermediaries sit. So you'll see that really it's the player who uses intermediaries the most. That's not surprising or, or not to be expected. Um, and also there are overlaps where in fact there are multiple parties who are using intermediaries. So this is an overall uh, picture and view, and this is what it looks like for 2018 in particular. Okay? So I'm not going to go over the figures in detail. You have them there. But suffice it to say, it may be interesting to note that when there's a transfer fee involved, there's a heavier use of intermediaries, as would be expected. Uh, for us, what's interesting to see, of course, is that there are many situations where there's no transfer fee where you still see the presence of an intermediary. 
In TMS, um, at the present time, we only collect information about what clubs pay to intermediaries. We do not collect information on what players may have paid to intermediaries. So we only can collect the information showing what either the engaging club or the releasing club pays to intermediaries. And the numbers are, are staggering, I think. And, and you'll see that really the growth in terms of the payments to intermediaries has been increasing year over year. And again, we see that the engaging club is the club that is the most responsible when paying, when paying agents. This is a look at intermediaries by confederation level. Again, uh, no surprise given the volume of money that sits in transfers when we're talking about transfer fees. No surprise, therefore, that in uh, the situation of intermediaries, it's again UEFA who's predominantly paying, or clubs in UEFA, who are predominantly paying money to intermediaries. Um, the AFC is also paying, as is uh, CONMEBOL, um, and a little bit in CAF and CONCACAF. But if you, when you get your slide, you may want to go home and, and look at what's interesting when I, when I was preparing these is to note that the transfer fees at the AFC are the second highest next to UEFA, but CONMEBOL is the second highest in terms of the agents or, or who they're paying, the clubs in CONMEBOL paying the agents. So, as I said, all of this data you'll get in slides and also you can find in the Global Transfer Market Report. So, turning now to compliance, um, how do we make sure that what the clubs put in TMS is correct, that the data and information is correct, and how do we make sure that clubs and member associations are following the regulations, the FIFA regulations on the status and transfer of players, which govern the activity in the transfer matching system? So many of you will be familiar uh, with the two processes that we have, the ASP process and the traditional case file process. This is a snapshot in 2018 of cases opened and closed. And what's important to recognize is that the number of cases closed mean compliance. So we see a good number of compliance, both on behalf of clubs and member associations. And in fact, at the TMS level, where we are authorized to sanction up to 14,000 Swiss francs, there were only 12 cases heard uh, in 2018. A number of our cases uh, were transferred to the FIFA Disciplinary Committee. You heard Mario talk about this in his presentation this morning. Um, and you'll see there are two types of cases, again, that the Disciplinary Committee hears. Um, 25 ASP cases. These are for minor infractions, technical infringements in the system. Um, and then we have a, a greater number of traditional case files, which more, are more robust systemic breaches in the system. Um, the biggest area here, of course, are minor cases, so failure to engage um, with the correct application process in TMS or moving minors um, in breach of a decision made by the Players Data Committee, and also uh, third-party ownership, TPO and TPI are cases that we looked at um, this year as well. Media releases. Um, we do our best to make sure that you get the information that you need. Um, and FIFA Media puts out media releases. In April, there was a media release which identified a number of cases heard by the disciplinary committee in connection with third party uh, breaches of third party ownership and third party influence. This is one of such cases. And the only thing I would identify for you is while there was a fine here, it was not only for a breach of TPO. It was also for a breach of confidentiality and also a failure to um, enter correct and mandatory information in TMS. So it's not just one breach, but multiple breaches. There are two cases, uh, two cases that have a TMS element that were dealt with by CAS in 2018. Um, the Bridge Transfer case, Sud America case, you may be familiar with that, as well as the Fe Sevilla FC TPO case. And what I thought might be interesting for you to know is how these cases started. How do we find out about these cases? Uh, the first case started because a club failed to upload a proof of payment. So seemingly what would be a technical breach then of course turned into a much bigger case. And in the second case, in the Sevilla decision, it actually was an Italian agent who gave information to the FIFA disciplinary department and as a result we started to look into things. Um, there are a number of data requests that we get from CAS. Um, and we obviously give that information to them, although it's sanitized um, and we only give the limited information that they need to make the determination in that judicial proceeding. We do take confidentiality of the clubs and associations seriously and are careful not to disclose any information other than what's specifically needed. 
So player passports, why am I talking about player passports? You had a number of questions earlier today about solidarity contribution and training compensation. One of the key elements um, for this is the creation of the player passport, which of course is the CV or the history of where the player has been registered. This player passport is meant to be delivered by the releasing association when they deliver the ITC. Unfortunately, records throughout the world, remembering that FIFA deals with everything, I mean, 211 member associations, so Bolivia, uh, to the Solomon Islands, to Ghana, um, to the Netherlands, um, there's a wide variety of difference between how these member associations and their clubs register players. So there was a lack in TMS about player passports, and we worked hard this year to ensure that the over 10,000 player passports that were missing in TMS um, were uploaded in TMS. And so we did a pretty good job. We still, it's not perfect, but 75% of our member associations now are in compliance with respect to transfers that have already happened, okay? When we talk about player passports, and we know that this is the key for solidarity contribution and training compensation, I wanna to turn to my last subject, um, which is the, the importance of training rewards and the FIFA Clearinghouse. So as many of you know, we had a presentation earlier today about the FIFA regulations and these two distinct regimes, the solidarity uh, contribution mechanism and the training compensation mechanism. And we know that there's an ongoing challenge for clubs to get compensated for the money that they may be owed for training the players. We also know that there are a number of issues with these current regimes. They don't really meet the demands of modern day football. The calculation of payments is complicated and burdensome. There's maybe a lack of awareness and understanding which causes incorrect calculations and reporting and non-payment of fees. We also know there's an inconsistent approach to the way in which players are registered. The tracking of a player's history is challenging at best, um, and oftentimes the records are not electronic or they're poorly kept. And unfortunately, at the present time, we know that as FIFA, we don't really have measures to ensure that the full amount of solidarity contribution or training compensation is paid, other than if a club comes to TMS, uploads a, a complaint in the system, and it's dealt with by player status, as you've heard. So the last figure is we know that the, the player status has dealt with it, an enormous number of these cases in, in a certain period of time. This slide is interesting because as part of what clubs declare in TMS, not only do they declare transfer fees, they also declare a solidarity contribution and training compensation that they have paid in connection with the transfer. The blue bar shows you the actual solidarity contribution that has been paid. The gray bar shows you training compensation that clubs have declared in the system. The green bar shows you what should have been paid. So what you see here is something that Alistair mentioned at the beginning, which is there's this delta of about 300 million US dollars that somehow has not made it to the clubs who've trained the players. And it's this gap that the task force has been looking at, that my colleague Giancarlo will talk to you a little bit more about the work of the task force. It's this problem, which we've also heard you talk about today, that we're trying to fix. So, we know the system is too complicated. We know there's poor records of the history of where the players have been registered, and we know that there's this limited oversight and control. So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna fix it? Right? It's a big question. Well, um, we've talked about establishing a clearinghouse. And the idea of this clearinghouse is to ensure that clubs are adequately rewarded for when they train players. It's to create an incentive for clubs who invest in the training and the education of young players. It's to simplify the existing training compensation and solidarity contribution mechanism and to ensure that there's greater oversight and transparency when we give these rewards back to the training clubs, right? So those are our guiding principles. Our objectives are to simplify and harmonize the method to calculate the rewards, to ensure effective and timely redistribution of the awards, to increase transparency, to mitigate money laundering, and to create a central management and oversight of these rewards. Okay? So these are our guiding principles and our objectives. On October 16th, um, you may have read in the media 
that the members of the FIFA Council endorsed a reform package, a first reform package, agreed by the FIFA Stakeholder Committee. And part of this reform package was for the mandatory implementation or the mandatory introduction of an electronic transfer system modeled on the ITMS system, as well as uh, an electronic domestic registration system. So these systems, we say, should be electronic and online in order to ensure an accurate and easily accessible player registration history, right? The goal here is to make sure that all associations all over the globe have access to the tools that they need in order to electronically register their players so we can create an electronic player passport. With this electronic player passport, the goal is to get the money that's due and owing to the training clubs paid to them. This is how it would look in principle. The idea is this electronic player passport will assist us in determining how much should be paid and who should be paid. So in this instance, you'd see the engaging club who would make a payment of training compensation and solidarity payment to a clearinghouse. And the clearinghouse, upon being provided about which clubs should be trained, will make that distribution of payments to the clubs. This would ensure certainly transparency. The idea is that it would be uh, quick. I think somebody asked a question earlier about what happens in the event that this payment is not made. That's an excellent question. Certainly something that we've considered and are looking at. Because it should not be permitted that if trading compensation and solidarity payment is due, that it's not paid and there's no consequence. So the idea is that in this system, because we'll be able to see everything, there would be a consequence in that situation. So how are we going to do it? How are we going to create this electronic player passport? Well, um, FIFA provides a number of digital solutions to its member associations. These are threefold. There's the DTMS system, which the Netherlands, the CanVB, was the first member association to adopt this system. They've been using it for quite some time. It's for the management of domestic players. The Connect platform is for the registration, the electronic registration of players, and the Connect ID is for the identification of players and the exchange of data. The exchange of data is very important because we recognize that certain associations are very advanced and already have their own electronic registration and their own domestic, electronic domestic transfer system, and that's fine. Um, in that instance, we would be looking to select certain elements of data and collect it all in one place in order to give effect to uh, the clearinghouse and most importantly, to ensure that the clubs who train and educate young players are rewarded for doing so. Simplifying and harmonizing the concepts of training compensation and solidarity contribution. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, we would have time for one or two questions. No questions? Thank you very much, Kimberly. So I will kindly ask now Giancarlo Dapoto, who will head of professional football for his presentation of today. Yes. Go right. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you all know, the, the biggest deals that take place at the, in, in uh, the transfer window always take place at the end. So I think this is a, a good reason why this, this presentation comes close to the end of the day. Although I have to say that I'm definitely not the big deal. When I, um, when I was thinking about the, looking at, to prepare this, this uh, presentation, I was curious to find out you know, when the who was the first player to, to transfer between two clubs. But without TMS, uh, back in uh, many years ago, as you can see from this photo, it was quite difficult to find this information out. But what I did find out was the, who was the first 100 pound player. So the player was signed from Aston Villa, um, signed for Aston Villa from West Bromwich Albion in 1893 uh, for 100 pounds. But Aston Villa was also fined by the Football Association due to illegally poaching this player from West Bromwich Albion. So, as you can see, there's always been problems with the, the transfer system, even back so many years ago. And if you're wondering, the player is uh, 
Patrick William Willie Groves. So just now I will, uh, I will go through in terms of where we stand in the reform process. I will explain briefly um, the need for the reform, even though I think throughout today's um, presentations it's quite clear that this need for a reform exists. I will express, uh, explain the, the process to date um, and, and where we, we stand as, as of today, the first reform package that has already been mentioned, and then what the continued work of the, of the reform of the transfer system will be. So as has been mentioned, the, the last major reform um, of the transfer system took place many years ago now in 2001. And this was based on a historic agreement uh, following the Bosman ruling of the European Court of Justice. The main objectives of the rules that were put in place back at that time were to encourage the training of young players through solidarity schemes, um, to protect contractual stability between players and clubs, as well as other matters in terms of you know, solidarity between the elite and grassroots football, protection of minors, competitive balance, and generally ensuring that there's a regularity of sporting competitions. So whilst these objectives and principles um, still remain sound, the landscape since 2001, and this has been seen as well through many of the numbers, has obviously significantly, significantly changed since then. Um, from the numbers that you saw from Kimberley's presentation, but also I just took this aggregate figure of the of the amount that's been spent on international transfers since the introduction of, of TMS in October 2010, and it's a, a staggering figure of, of 36 billion US dollars. Not only the, the size of transfer fees has become, uh, let's say, a worrying trend of today's transfer market, um, but there's been other trends which indicate that the original objectives maybe are not being fully achieved or are even being undermined. And I think there's a general feeling that the, the market is driven by speculation and not solidarity. Um, we have probably now the club trained players have reached an all time low, whereas expatriate players have reached an all time high. Contractual instability is, is obviously greater now as well. There's a growing influence of agents and this brings with it an increased risk of conflicts of interest. And there is always still the concerns in relation to competitive balance. Speaking about agents, I think this was a, you know, another example we saw just now about uh, training compensation and solidarity contribution and the, the difference between what is paid and what should actually be paid. And also I think it's, uh, it's you know, a clear example of, the, the, of the, one of the issues that is faced with the transfer system at the moment is the disparity that exists between the amount being spent on agent commissions and the amount that is being paid to training clubs. And so over the, this um, six year period since 2013, two, two billion US dollars has been spent on agent commissions from, from clubs. And this compares to just over 450 million that is paid for training compensation uh, and solidarity contribution to training clubs. If we look at the, the, just the last year, we see that this is a, is a, a continuous and increasing um, situation. So in 2018, 500, almost 550 million US dollars was spent by clubs on agent commissions, whereas only 90 US million dollars um, have been paid to training clubs. Therefore, based on this, um, as well as the other issues that currently exist with the, with the transfer system, the FIFA president made it, uh, sent a clear message that he wanted to address the current transfer system. And within uh, his manifesto of FIFA 2.0, the vision for the future, a clear objective was set, uh, which was to seriously revisit the transfer system with all stakeholders. Stakeholder engagement has been a pillar of, of many of FIFA's broad reforms and it's definitely been a cornerstone of the transfer system reform, reform process. Clubs, leagues, member associations, confederations, as well as FIFA, all agreed at the, the first meeting of the Football Stakeholders, Stakeholders Committee in March 2017, that the reform of the transfer system had to be a, a priority issue for the committee. And they agreed that 
the aim of this should be to uh, increase transparency, improve solidarity and reinforce contractual stability in the transfer system. And this reform process has definitely seen an unprecedented level of cooperation and collaboration among football, football stakeholders. The process began by um, separating the review into two phases. The first phase looked at the, the narrow issues, which has been spoken about already again this morning, but in relation to overdue payables and the abuse of players. And then the so-called broad issues, which are currently being looked at in relation to agents, training reward for clubs and young players, squad size and registration, and the fiscal regulation and homegrown players. Looking at the, the narrow issues, these arose um, out of a FIFA Pro complaint against FIFA at the European Commission in September 2015, where various aspects of the transfer system were challenged. An extensive multi-stakeholder negotiations took place on the, on the back of this. An agreement was eventually found in November 2017 to amend the FIFA regulations on the status and transfer of players in order to streamline this dispute resolution between players and clubs, and in particular, uh, the, the cases of overdue payables, and to introduce a new provision to avoid the abusive conduct of parties, um, such as players being forced to train alone. These amendments to the uh, regulations were mentioned this morning, so I won't go through them, that they were the, the, the articles that you see on the, on the screen now. Um, and they were then firstly endorsed by the Bureau of the Player Status Committee, approved by the FIFA Council in uh, March 2018, and then these amendments came into force in June 2018. Following the agreement on the narrow issues, uh, the Football Stakeholders Committee decided to establish a task force um, which would investigate and explore the, the broad issues of the tra transfer system. The, the task force acts as a, an advisory body to the sub, uh, uh, as an advisory subcommittee uh, to the stakeholders committee and provides advice and makes proposals and recommendations. It's chaired by the chairman of the stakeholders committee, the vice president of uh, one of the vice presidents of, of FIFA, Victor Montagliani, and it's composed of members of each of the stakeholder groups, FIFA Pro, ECA, and the World League Forum and uh, one member of uh, member associations representative and confederations representative. There are a few members of the task force sat in the audience today, so I'll take this chance just to thank them for the, the work that has been going on um, these, last, these last 18 months um, and which will, will continue in the future. The task force has been supported by the FIFA administration and it was, it was given the task of looking at the transfer system in general analyzing whether the system had achieved its objectives that were assigned uh, in 2001, considering whether it was still fit for purpose, assessing how it could be improved, and then making concrete proposal, proposals based on, based on this. A work plan was devised and, uh, on the broad issues and they were um, established four different topics to look at. Topic one was agents, topic two, training reward for clubs and young players, topic three, squad size and registration, and topic four, fiscal regulation and homegrown players. As you can see from this, I mean, the, the work started in earnest in, in 2018 of the task force. Um, just highlighted here all the different meetings that have taken place. So there were eight formal meetings of the task force spreading from, from January to November. Um, in addition to this, many other uh, working level meetings take, took place. There were four meetings with uh, agents as well. So agent consultation workshops took place in April, May, August and November. And two uh, European level meetings took place with the EU Commission in July and the EU Parliament in September. As you can imagine, there's you know, many different interests and positions put forward by the different stakeholders, which means that this reform process is a, is a lengthy process, but obviously the importance of it means that every single aspect needs to be looked at, considered. Um, so it, it is a long ongoing process. 
But um, in September uh, 2018, a big step was taken initially by the Football Stakeholders Committee endorsing uh, the first reform package, and this was subsequently endorsed then by the, uh, by the FIFA Council at its meeting in October. The reform package consisted of, as we've heard already, uh, the principle of, of creating a clearinghouse, which is then supported by the mandatory introduction of an electronic transfer system at national level and domestic electronic registration system. The agreement that there should be new and stronger regulations for agents, the regulation of loan player, the loans of players, and a solidarity contribution for domestic transfers with an international dimension. All of these reforms are aimed at increasing transparency, protecting the integrity, and really trying to reinforce solidarity mechanisms for training clubs. I think the clearinghouse, we've, we've heard already from Kimberley, the objectives are to protect a bit the integrity of football, may avoid any fraudulent conduct that could take place, and ensure the good functioning of football by centralizing and simplifying payments associated with transfers, such as solidarity, training compensation, agents commissions, and also potentially transfer fees as well. This is underpinned by uh, the need to have a uh, domestic um, electronic transfer system and a registration system. The modernization and improvement of, the, of these systems for member associations is obviously also a clear objective. We want to strengthen the player passport mechanism and through all of this facilitate stronger enforcement of the provisions of the regulations on the status and transfer of players. In terms of new and stronger regulations for agents, um, again, it was agreed that this is something that the, the task force should, should work towards and this was endorsed. And the principles that were agreed was to introduce uh, compensation and representation restrictions, as well as you know, payments of agents, commissions going through the clearinghouse, and then the licensing and registration of agents through the, the transfer matching system. The uh, overall objective of this is through you know, enhancing regulation and transparency. We aim to raise professional and ethical standards of, of agents. The thing that still needs to be devised, obviously, is, is exactly how to do this, and this is something that they, is being worked upon now by, by the task force. In terms of the regulation of loans of players, it was decided that uh, regulation for this should be developed, and the main purpose of this should be, obviously, youth development as opposed to commercial exploitation. The ways in which this uh, have been the, the ideas that have been considered is obviously to limit the number of loans per season and then also limit the number of loans between the same clubs. In addition, there would be the prohibition of bridge transfers and sub-loans. And the final part of the, of the reform package related to solidarity contributions for domestic transfers with an international dimension with the aim of further promoting solidarity and providing incentives to invest in the training and development of young players. So basically this means that uh, if a player, for example here, moves from Club X to Club Y in Italy, but he was trained by clubs uh, of a different association, so from clubs um, that were, he was trained in England, Despite it not being an international transfer, there is this international dimension and solidarity contribution will be uh, applicable in this case. To give a concrete example, it could be Gonzalo Higuain. When he transferred from Real Madrid to Napoli, because it was an international transfer, solidarity contribution was applicable. And his training club, which I think was just one club, River Plate, was entitled to solidarity contribution. But then when there was the, the transfer from Napoli to Juventus, which was a, a, a domestic transfer within Italy, they were not entitled to solidarity contribution. So these new regulations will mean that the training clubs where there is this international dimension will receive the amounts for um, solidarity contribution. And I, 
I think an estimation um, on the 2017-18 season was that with this, if this principle had been applied then, approximately almost 40 million US dollar, dollars would have been redistributed to training clubs. So these were the, the, the aspects of the first reform package and uh, as well as endorsing this, this first re reform package in October, the FIFA Council also decided to endorse the continued work of the, of the stakeholders committee in order to, for them to transform together with the player status committee um, this, this first reform package into a concrete set of regulations but also to continue the consultation process with all stakeholders in order to address the open issues um, that still, still have not been finalized. These open issues are still in relation to agents, uh, the transfer of young players to so the protection of minors, training reward for clubs and young players in terms of exactly how uh, training compensation and solidarity contribution can be improved, squad size and registration, and fiscal regulation. So in terms of agents, various models of compensation and representation restrictions have been debated. This debate is still, still ongoing, um, but some principles have been agreed in, in, in respect of this. That obviously any rules that are introduced need to be simple and enforceable that the commission that is paid to agents should actually reflect the value of the services that they provide, and that the services that are provided are actually similar irrespective of which, um, of which party is being represented. So in this respect, the creation of a balanced and neutral system needs to be found. In terms of the transfer of young players so in protection of minors, there's been general and open discussion on the objectives of, of, of this, uh, this principle. Obviously, the focus is always on protecting young players against exploitation, mistreatment. But there's a, a feeling that there should be a better balance between protection and opportunities. So not that things uh, go too far in terms of preventing opportunities for young players. But obviously, these opportunities, they need to... Um, we need to consider what the best environment for the training and education of the, of the young players is, recognize the, important of, the importance of the family unit, and also there's the question of also trying to ensure, ensure some legal certainty and look at whether there's any possibility to harmonize the rules which currently exist in terms of the, the differences between transfers in and outside of Europe. Again, the discussions are ongoing, still at quite a, a high principle level, but these are some of the, the, the way that, uh, and the issues that are being considered by the, the task force. In terms of training reward for clubs and, and young players, as has been mentioned throughout the day, I think, with training compensation and solidarity contribution, um, there are issues, obviously, with the, the current system, so this needs to be uh, reviewed in order to find uh, a more simple framework and uh, ensure that the mechanism is effective in terms of the training clubs and um, being adequately compensated for the, for the work that they do. So it's really a, a way of different models are being looked at, what can be done, do we have to change the, the, the way the rules are currently applied. Um, obviously the clearinghouse is, is one of the big ways of, even with the existing rules, improving the situation and ensuring that um, a much higher proportion of the amounts that should be paid will actually be paid to the training clubs. In terms of squad size and uh, registration, um, I think it's felt that uh, there are issues in terms of um, balance and fairness of competitions at the moment when squad sizes are not regulated. So, um, and this is also linked to the loan uh, of players as well. So hopefully if some form of squad size uh, limit can be implemented, this is something that could potentially deter some of the issues in terms of player hoarding, excessive loans, and try and ensure a better distribution of, of the talent of players. 
which in turn should hopefully then achieve um, higher competitive balance and also incentivize youth development. In terms of registration, there's a lack of consistency probably at the moment in terms of the transfer windows and all of these measures really uh, are being considered to try and ensure better regularity and proper functioning of competitions. The last topic that is, is being dis discussed is in relation to fiscal regulation. Probably is one of the more complex a a aspects to address and it's very early stages, but you know, it's to see whether there's any way of maybe regulating the amount of transfer fees or um, amount of uh, salaries that are paid to players with the objective of, of improving financial stability of football clubs and also again looking at the issue of competitive balance. So this is a little bit where we stand with the work of the, the task force at the moment. Um, the task force is going to continue to work on these open issues. Once they arrive at the point of being able to make recommendations, these will go to the Football Stakeholders Committee and then the FIFA Council for our endorsement. Once this has been done, then obviously whatever is agreed needs to be transformed into a set of concrete regulations. Final point just to mention is that FIFA and the members of the task force are committed to concluding this work in what we hope will be the most significant reform to the transfer system since its inception. So thank you for, for that. Thank you very much, Giancarlo. So if you have any questions, he gave us a clear overview. Yes, we have some questions over there. Thank you very much. Um, congratulations, because uh, a very nice presentation, uh, this one and the previous one, and I think it's uh, a big step uh, to, to improve uh, integrity and transparency in sport. But my, my doubt is, have to think about the, uh, because you need to control uh, commissions uh, in order to, to clean, uh, to clarify the, the, the transfer of players. But the question is, what happens when the commission are out of the clean house? There is, uh, have you think about some consequence if that happens and how to control it? I think that strong uh, compliance and enforcement will be needed. So obviously, it's with any regulations you put in place, there can always be um, people or bodies or parties that try to uh, get around the system. But obviously, when drafting the regulations, and this is what I think we said at one of the points, that they need to be enforceable and as simple as possible, because obviously to be credible, we cannot avoid that um, regulations are put in place that cannot be uh, appropriately implemented. So this is obviously a parallel consideration that goes together with um, thinking of new measures, but you have to think how they can be implemented and how, how they can be enforced. Thank you, Ricardo. Any other questions, remarks? Well, then, thank you very much. And then we could continue with the Next and last presentation of the day. I am pleased to announce the next speaker, Jaime. He is the head of litigations and he will provide you with uh, cast proceedings, figures, and leading cases. I have my own. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maya. Good afternoon to everyone and to everyone watching on FIFA.com. I know I'm the last one to speak. Some people have told me today that this is called the graveyard shift. I see that you're very much alive today, so I promise to make the wait uh, worthwhile. I think there's an issue with the presentation. Okay, here we go. No. Nope. There we go. 
So first of all, I will introduce the litigation department. This is a department that was created two and a half, two and a half months ago. It's brand new. And the purpose of the creation of this department was basically to tackle the exponential increase in the number of cases that we have been dealing with recently, uh, cases before the Court of Arbitration for Sport, and also to better coordinate and harmonize the work uh, of FIFA when dealing with arbitral proceedings before CAS. So um, this is also the result of our, the way we are internally organized in the legal division, where we have five different departments that, due to their nature, are dealing with CAS proceedings. With a quick glance of the figures that uh, will follow now, you will see why there was a need to have this litigation department where um, the proceedings would be coordinated and harmonized. Well, let's first take a look at how many cases started before the Court of Arbitration for Sport as a result of appeals against FIFA decisions. Well, the magic number is 207. This is the amount of decisions passed by FIFA, bo FIFA bodies uh, that were appealed before CAS. In terms of uh, FIFA being a party to those proceedings, we were not a party to all of them. The, as you are aware, and as many of the uh, cases that were presented today by our colleagues from the player status department, there are horizontal disputes where FIFA has no standing to be sued. And this amounts to 60% of these cases. And 40% correspond to those cases where FIFA was a party. In numbers, it's 82 procedures and 125. By topic, you can see the different uh, amount of cases per department. The disciplinary department last year took the lead with 40 cases, followed closely by player status, then by institutional legal, which concerns those decisions passed by the FIFA Council, mainly, and other bodies that are not the judicial bodies, let's say, or player status and dispute resolution chamber. Then the ethics committee's decisions, um, were less than five cases, and at the top of the chart you can see the anti-doping, which is not a, an appeal against the FIFA decision, but it's FIFA actually appealing a decision, in that case, of a confederation, because as you know, similarly to WADA with respect to other international federations, including FIFA, FIFA has the right to appeal decisions passed by its member associations and confederations if it considers that they were not in line with the FIFA anti-doping regulations. Now, We've seen what started during 2018. Let's see what finished during 2018. So how many awards and which awards we received during last year. Well, first of all, a quick comparison or quick uh, relationship between the moment the, the proceedings started and the moment the proceedings finished. Well, half, almost half of those awards were uh, commenced during 2017 and the other half during 2018. And as you can see, there, was, there is a considerable increase in the number of awards where there was a termination order or, or an awards of cost. Uh, therefore, there was some kind of procedural issue there that didn't allow the panel or the sole arbitrator to look into the merits of the case. But now let's focus on those cases where we actually play the game, where the panels had to go and analyze the substance of the, of the matters. Well, in these cases, here you will see the outcome, which is vastly favorable to FIFA, because 82% of the cases of those decisions appealed um, again uh, before CAS were actually dismissed, so therefore the decisions were confirmed only 60% uh, were partially upheld, meaning that those decisions were somehow amended. And there was only one decision, which is this 2% that I show you here with this small disclaimer, which is one award where a decision was completely set aside and it was basically due to new evidence that had never been produced at the first instance proceedings. In terms of Again, by department, an interesting number. Also, uh, while well, you can see here the main two topics, disciplinary and player status, the number of cases that were dismissed, partially upheld, and upheld, as mentioned right now. With respect to ethics, it's a 50-50 between the dismissed and the partially upheld case, which was pre were both presented, actually, uh, by Carlos this morning. Institutional legal, so the decisions passed by the council, the four of them uh, were fully confirmed. And lastly, the only decision that FIFA appealed was partially upheld. So basically, there's a vast confirmation, as I said before, of FIFA's decision. In my opinion, this 
is a reflection of the good work that is being done by our different committees and by the uh, general administration that is working for those committees. Only one decision was overturned, as I, as I mentioned, due to new facts. And there is a considerable increase in the number of those cases that do not end up with an uh, arbitral award. In some occasions, it's just because of procedural errors. But in other occasions, as could be uh, those decisions of Article 64, the increase in the efficiency of the system has led many clubs to lodge an appeal before CAS in order to automatically stay the execution of those amounts. And therefore, this misuse of the system is what, in my opinion, has led now CAS in 2019 to impose advance of cost for the appeals of precisely monetary decisions and enforcement uh, proceedings. So let's move on now to some leading cases that I selected um, in order to present to you. First, we go to Spain, to Sevilla, and the Sevilla Football Club. This is a case um, of, article, of a violation of Article 18 bis which basically, uh, for those of you who don't know it, contains a prohibition on, uh, for basically anyone to have a possibility to influence or the real capacity actually to influence a club's ability to determine its own policies in transfer and employment related matters. So what happened in this case? Briefly, let's go through the facts. Well, in, on the 23rd of July 2012, there was an agreement signed between the Club Sevilla and the company Doyen Investment Limited. On the same day, coincidentally or not, there was a transfer agreement that was signed between Sevilla and the French club uh, Lens for the transfer of the player Condoglia. Three days later, the player, as is usual, signs an employment contract with Sevilla, and eight months later, so just before the next transfer win window, this economic rights participation agreement is signed between Sevilla and Doyen. Three months later, when the um, when the uh, registration period arrives, Condovia unilaterally terminates his contract and Monaco pays the buyout clause to Sevilla. Well, what happened in these agreements? To make it short, in the economic rights participation agreement, Doyen paid to Sevilla an amount of 3 million euros, and the reasons were half of it for 50% of the player's economic rights and the other half as a loan with a minimum return that um, I think amounted to almost two million. Let's recall this is in 2013 where TPO is still not prohibited by FIFA, so these kind of transactions were actually allowed. What wasn't allowed is for someone else to be able to exert influence on Sevilla. What else was agreed in general terms? Well, the transfer fee that Sevilla had to pay to the French club was already agreed between Doyen and Sevilla. The economic and employment conditions that were going to be offered to the player were also agreed by Doyen and Sevilla. The commission that was going to be paid to the player's agent and also certain conditions under which Sevilla would have to transfer the player in the future. So the disciplinary committee, after um, analyzing the whole situation, decided to sanction Sevilla with a 55,000 Swiss franc fine, determining that this agreement granted Doyen an effective ability to influence the club. Later on, the appeal committee confirmed this decision as it considered also that Doyen had the power to influence Sevilla on several matters. Well, findings of CAS. CAS, I can already, spoiler alert, I can advance to you, confirm the decision in full. First of all, the club claimed that Article 18 bis was incompatible with the European Union law. They um, did quite a few uh, considerations on this topic and CAS discarded it in full. They considered, the panel in this case, considered that it's fully compatible with, your, with EU law, especially when considering the specificity of sport, which is specifically recognized in the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. And also because this prohibition is reasonable, is proportionate and is justified by the aim that it pursues, by the objective that is, that is pursued. So basically, there was, according to this panel, there was no restriction of free movement of capital, there was no restriction of free movement of workers, there's no freedom to provide financial services as the, as the club was claiming, and very importantly, this article does not 
restrict competition uh, and it is not an abuse of a dominant position by FIFA. Um, the panel also considered that it was fully compatible with Swiss law and very importantly, the panel made reference to the Serran case in which CAS and the Swiss Federal Tribunal had already confirmed this and considered that this debate was obsolete and it had already been um, clarified well enough by these two entities. Well, then CAS went on to analyze actually what does Article 18 bis prohibit because this is a question that many clubs seem not to have um, very clear. Well, what is prohibited here is the real capacity to produce effects over someone else's decision-making procedure. Clubs, uh, and I know this from the experience uh, in, in disciplinary cases uh, that we've dealt with in the past, clubs in these cases when they defend themselves, when we have open proceedings, the majority of the time they claim no influence was ever exerted. There's no proof that this person managed to have an influence over my decision-making process. Well, the disciplinary committee has always defended and now has confirmed it that this is actually correct. Article 18 this prohibits the fact that there is a possibility to influence, not that there is an actual influence being exerted. The only need is that this actual possibility has to be effective, it has to be binding, and it has to be specific. In this specific case, what were the breaches of Article 18 bis by the club? Well, CAS considered after doing an over or a systematic and general interpretation of the contract as well as uh, an individualized analysis of the different clauses, that Doyen indeed had the ability, the genuine and effective ability to influence over Sevilla's decision-making process. Sevilla actually could not make entirely independent decisions on uh, some very important aspects like the way the player would be released if, it, if Sevilla wished to release it. So transfer-related influence, which is one of the aspects that is prohibited. Sevilla in this case could not transfer the player could not transfer 50% of its economic rights, let's say, which are the, is the, the, the amount that it, it uh, had from the player, let's say. It required Doyen's prior consent. In addition, and in the same line, if an offer of six million, it was specified in the contract, would be received, Sevilla was obligated either to sell the player or to pay 50% of that amount to Doyen. So you will say, well, but Sevilla wasn't really obligated. They could pay this amount to, they could pay this amount to Doyen and they would be free, but of course, it's a considerable amount that would have to be paid. In fact, in the contract itself, there was an example where it was established that if there would have been an offer of 15 million for the player, Sevilla, in order to retain the player, would have had to pay almost 9 million euros to Doyen. In employment-related influence, well, Sevilla could not reduce the player's buyout clause, which is a very important element of the uh, player's employment contract, even more in Spain. And there was an obligation for Sevilla to buy Doyen's share in case it decided, for whatever reason, to increase considerably the player's employment conditions. So all in all, the appeal, as I mentioned before, was dismissed as it was considered that the, uh, the Doyen Investment Limited could actually uh, exercise influence over, decision, over Sevilla's decision-making process. So, conclusions, Article 18 bis, similarly to Article 18 ter, are fully compatible with EU and Swiss law. There is actually no need for the influence to be exerted. There's only a possibility that has to be, um, that has to be reflected in a contract, that has to be binding on both parties. And just uh, as an update, because um, the case was based on the previous edition of the regulations, the current edition in force since 2015 uh, covers the sanctioning of both the influencer and the influenced party, let's say. So let's move on now to doping. Most of you will probably know or at least have heard about this case concerns the Peruvian player 
Paolo Guerrero, and it was quite well known because uh, the CAS award was actually, um, or the operative part of the CAS award was rendered before the FIFA World Cup and it had an impact on the competition. Well, briefly, let's go through the facts. As you know, doping cases are quite factual, so it's important to recall what happened here. Well, the, there was a, a match played between Peru and Argentina in the qualifiers for the World Cup, and the player underwent a doping control where there was an adverse analytical finding uh, for cocaine, the cocaine metabolite benzoylecognine. The disciplinary committee provisionally suspended the player. This was confirmed by the appeal committee. And thereafter, when analyzing the decision on the merits, the disciplinary committee decided to impose a one-year sanction, which was later on reduced by the appeal committee, who considered that the principle of proportionality should be, um, in, should be uh, taken into consideration here and overriding the minimum sanction that was prescribed according to the FIFA anti-doping regulations. After this, uh, as you can see from the title of the slide, Guerrero, the player, filed an appeal as he was asking to be acquitted from any, uh, from any infringement. And WADA also lodged another appeal because actually WADA was asking for the complete opposite. WADA was asking for almost two years initially to be imposed on the player. Well, well what were the player's possibilities? He could, and that is, this is what he pleaded actually, he could plead for no fault or negligence, so basically he, he had no way of knowing that he was taking a prohibited substance. He could have claimed it wasn't, uh, it wasn't done in a, very, um, in a very insistent manner, let's say, that he had taken a contaminated product, so a product that even when reading the label or we're doing a, a general internet search would not lead to the conclusion that, they, that, they, uh, that the, uh, the, uh, the drink in this case contained a prohibited substance, or he could have pleaded for no significant fault or negligence, where basically his conduct was not as harsh to impose the standard two-year sanction. So this had very different implications because, of, of course, the player was asking or was looking to be acquitted, to not be sanctioned. With a contaminated product, it will, the minimum sanction could have been also a no period of ineligibility, so no suspension and only a reprimand. And with a no significant fault or negligence, the minimum sanction according to the regulations would be one year. Well, in order to first analyze uh, the case, the panel, as the disciplinary appeal committees did, had to analyze whether the player had demonstrated the source of the, of the substance. Well, this is not a real case of cocaine, of the use of the drug cocaine. This is a case of drinking a coca tea. Coca tea, which you might or might not know, but it's a very popular drink in Andean countries like Peru. Well, in this case, the player pleaded that he had taken different teas in the upcoming, in the days leading to the match. And in particular, T2 was the version that the all adjudicating bodies believed to be the correct one. He focused on two aspects, that the most likely source would have been T number two. So basically, he inadvertently drank a coca tea while being in the hotel where the whole national team was, um, was preparing themselves for this match. And that in these circumstances, because of these facts, he could not be found to have, uh, to have committed any fault or negligence. Well, T2 was, actually, was, was a plausible option, an explanation, but due to the, the sample and the amount of the benzoylecognine, this uh, metabolite of cocaine that was found, it was also possible scientifically that this would be the result of a late uh, intake of the drug, of uh, cocaine. So it could either be that he took cocaine four to seven days before the test, or that he drank a coca tea two days before the test. Well, due to several, um, due to several facts uh, that were explained and defended by the player, and which, again, both all the disciplinary appeal committees of FIFA and CAS believed, T2 was the most reasonable explanation, and the player managed to prove to a balance of probability, so 51%, that 
the tea number two was the source of the substance. And why? Because, well, coca tea is widely consumed in Peru, so it was possible and it was credible that there was an inadvertent intake of, of this kind of tea. The hotel in Lima did serve this tea, it was proven. There were several witness statements that also uh, led to that conclusion and there were no indications of the player having, or having used in the past or being a usual um, drug user. And the panel also reflected that it would have been unwise, although it would not have been the first time, that a player would have risked his career at the verge of his career, let's say, in the most important moment of his, um, of his long career as an international player where Peru was about to qualify for the first time to the World Cup. So overall, T2 was uh, accepted by all adjudicating bodies. And also all adjudicating bodies decided that with respect to fault, the player did not exercise his utmost caution. So he, he did not do absolutely everything in his power to avoid ingesting the coca tea. He relied on a waiter preparing the tea. He relied on the assumption that a previous tea that he had taken under the supervision of the nutritionist of the national team uh, would be exactly the same one as he was taking a few hours later. And also that there were some food and beverage protocols implemented in this room which were actually inexistent. Of course, and as established in the Water Code, the shift or the burden, let's say, of any absence of any food and beverage protocols could not be uh, shifted to the Peru Football Association. So again, all bodies decided and agreed that there was actually no significant fault. And in fact, this fault was quite light. And why? Well, because as mentioned by this panel, the prohibited substance was in a tea, it wasn't a drug. And the fact that it's in a tea makes it less usual that, the, that, that in a medicine or in a supplement that it might have a, or it might contain a prohibited substance. Let's remember once again that we're talking about a 34-year-old player with an international experience. So he's used to being, as the panel uh, mentioned, cocooned in a, an environment, a protected environment, where he believes that everything uh, that he will eat or drink is safe. And therefore, while this belief is not enough to conclude that there is no fault, it is enough to weigh the degree of fault and lower it to a uh, finding of no significant fault. Finally, and this is the main point, the most interesting point in my opinion, and where there was a divergent view between CAS and the appeal committee. Well, while the appeal committee considered that this case, because of the specific details and the specific circumstances that led to the adverse analytical finding, uh, there was a need actually to override the minimum sanction imposed in FIFA's own regulation, go over it and adopt a sanction that would be more in line and more proportionate to the um, offense that was committed. Well, obviously, uh, CAS did not, did not agree. And actually, they considered that the minimum in the regulations had to be respected, that the only principle of proportionality that could be applied was between the range of one and two years, which was the applicable sanction. And while it could be questionable that cocaine, which is a plant-based substance and it's a drug of abuse, was the only substance of this sort that is, con that is qualified as a non-specified substance as, as opposed to specified, well, the water prohibited list is not challengeable as um, it, it's already um, included in the list itself. And then the upcoming uh, FIFA World Cup could also not be a reason to override the minimum sanction, although this last point was never even mentioned by the FIFA Appeal Committee in its findings. Well, with respect to the WADA code itself, the panel considered that this edition of the WADA code has been repeatedly found to be proportionate in its approach to sanctions. FIFA is fully, um, is fully on board with the defense of the WADA code, of course, but it still defended that, again, for this particular scenario, the legislator could not have foreseen the uh, consequences that an intake of a coca tea could have on a player, on an athlete. So FIFA considered, the appeal committee considered that this lacuna, this gap, allowed the application of the principle of proportionality. 
Then the panel also mentioned that um, it could not be uh, tempted to surpass the limits of the water code because its application could be harsh on the player or that, and focus this on the fact that the anti-doping program is designed to protect athletes' health and ensure fair competition. Well, this is correct and this is true, but it's also correct, or at least that's, this is my opinion, that there was no, none of these two principles were infringed here. It's a cockatee which doesn't harsh anyone's health and it doesn't uh, enhance performance. In any case, WADA again partially upheld the, the appeal and finally sanctioned the player with a 14 month match suspension. So a period of ineligibility. Well, this is not the end of the case because the CAS operative award only the terms were notified in May 2018, so just before the national teams that have qualified to the World Cup, like Peru, had to lodge their list of players. The operative part was rendered due to this urgency. Two weeks later, the appeal lodged a or an appeal against the Swiss Federal Tribunal, which granted the super provisional measures, basically an injunction on the uh, decision of CAS, according to which in very simple terms, because the player could not defend himself because he didn't know the grounds why he was being sanctioned with a 14-month suspension, the, um, he could not bear that burden and suffer the consequences of not being in the World Cup. So therefore, he managed to play the World Cup. He actually played a couple of matches with Peru. And after this, WADA requested the lifting of the provisional suspension, which was accepted by the Swiss Federal Tribunal. And currently, the proceedings are ongoing, and we will expect an award in the upcoming months. So conclusions, well, the differentiation and the classification of specified and unspecified substances, open questions like could cocaine be shifted in the new uh, list from, one, from uh, one category to the other in order to enable a more flexible approach to the sanctioning of this kind of adverse analytical findings. Well then, where's the balance between legal certainty and proportionality. Of course, this panel decided to uh, prioritize legal certainty instead of proportionality. My question is whether a six-month suspension could have been sufficient to punish Guerrero and to deter other athletes from incurring in the same behavior. I think it still would have been um, a proportionate sanction, but well, Obviously, this panel, which is the opinion that counts, did not consider it so. And finally, I think I'm not the only one to have this opinion, because in the current draft of the Water Code, there's a creation of the category of substance of abuse. And in fact, according to this, cocaine would be um, included in this category. And there is a fixed sanction or proposal for a fixed sanction for three months, which is even lower than what the Appeal Committee decided, with a possible reduction to one month in case the athlete decides to undergo a rehabilitation program. So it seems, or at least in this first draft, which is, uh, as I understand, uh, in, in one of the initial phases of the review of the code, at least there is a proposal, an initial proposal, to change the approach to these kind of cases. And then, to finish, we will go, we will stay actually in South America, we, we go to Uruguay. And this is a case of the club Institución Atlética Sudamérica that was sanctioned by FIFA as a result of conducting what is called or what is known as bridge transfers. Well, in this case, actually the club didn't even dispute the fact that this was a bridge transfer. So this wasn't really analyzed, the, the, the essence or the nature of this kind of transaction wasn't analyzed in the case, but for a better understanding, um, I will explain briefly what this, cons what this kind of schemes con consist of. Well, YASA, Uruguayan club, hires a player, normally from a higher category club. In this case, we're talking about six players that were hired by this club in the same transfer window, all of them coming from Chile and Argentina. As a second step, YASA, and this usually happens two to three days after the employment contract is signed, loans the player to, let's call it club two. Player X and club two obviously sign an employment, an employment contract and club two pays a loan fee to YASA. Now, the next point 
is not necessarily what happened in this case because actually the club was never transparent and open to the reasons that led it to conduct these kind of transactions. But this is one of the reasons why bridge transfers are conducted. Well, IASA pays 90% of the loan fee received from, the, from Club 2 normally in Argentina, pays 90% to the player. Then the player, re the player receives that money and IASA retains 10%. And what happens, what's the difference between Argentina and Uruguay? Well, in Uruguay, the tax is much lower than in Argentina. So therefore, this is, let's say, an undercover signing bonus for the player where he will, uh, or where the club will have to pay a lower amount in order for the player to receive the same, the same bonus. And finally, and not surprisingly, the player ends up playing full time with the Argentinian club where he stays because that's where he initially intended to go. So these were, this happened with six players in the same transfer window and six players that never trained and never played with IASA. So IASA was clearly the middle club, the bridge club, that enabled this lower payment in, for example, uh, taxes for an undercover signing bonus. Again, point four could be this or it could be some other reasons um, which were not really explained by the club. In any case, the issue here was not whether this was a bridge transfer or not. The issue here was whether this article can be used by the disciplinary committee to sanction this kind of behavior. Well, the disciplinary committee considered that the fact that Article 9 of Annex 3 of the regulations on the status and transfer of players read that sanctions may be imposed on any association or club found to have, and let's go to the end of the sentence, to have misused TMS for illegitimate purposes. The misuse of TMS for illegitimate purposes was considered by the disciplinary committee as a sufficient legal basis to impose a two registration period transfer ban on YASA and a fine of 40,000 Swiss francs. Well, fortunately for the club, unfortunately for probably uh, football in general, has considered that this legal basis was not enough. Has considered that disciplinary, disciplinary sanctions must be imposed on the basis of certain and specific prohibited conducts, and bridge transfers are not considered as illegitimate since they are not expressly prohibited in any of FIFA's regulations. Well, if you recall the case that was presented uh, before with uh, Chung, it was actually the other way around, what, Cass, or what that panel was saying. Of course, it was not the same legal basis, but the principle was the same. A general article can be used, in fact, to uh, sanction, because FIFA cannot foresee every single scenario, every single scheme that stakeholders will sometime uh, come up with. The use of TMS was not done correctly, and this is actually why the decision was only partially upheld and the FIFA and the fine, sorry, was confirmed. And again, also similarly to the Chung case, although here at least it didn't have a real impact on the, on the club because the registration period that was initially imposed was stayed during this time. But again, a delay in the communication of the grounds of the appeal committee of several years already was considered to be a sanction itself. As a result, the decision was basically to um, dismiss or reject the registration periods and uh, confirm the, fi the fine as a result of Yasa not having updated the situation of the players in the system, which appeared to be still on loan with Yasa. Well, as a conclusion, the question is whether the simulation of a transaction in TMS can be considered an illegitimate use of the system or not. The predictability test, can a club reasonably assume that it will be sanctioned if it conducts fraudulent, let's say, transactions in TMS, which is not prepared or it wasn't thought for this kind of, of transactions? Open questions for, for you to reflect on if you wish. And also as, um, as a way to look to the future, 
the prohibition of bridge transfers seems to be one of the points that are being under discussion by the task force, so it seems that it will be included sometime soon in the regulation on the status and transfers players in order to avoid precisely that these kind of, um, of schemes keep on happening in football. That is all from my side. Thank you very much. So we still have two or three minutes for some questions. Do you have any questions for Jaime? So if nobody has a question, thank you very much, Jaime. And I give the floor to the two gentlemen on my right side. Maya. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so hopefully that was enough material for today. Um, and that you're all still feeling refreshed and not as if you've been run over by a 10-ton truck. So, uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, the, the idea, the aim of the exercise was to do a kind of 360-degree overview of the legal work being carried out by FIFA. If we didn't you know, make the whole circle today. We certainly got through a lot of it, and, uh, and it's just the beginning, because we'll do this again. There'll be a lot more material made available on the website, because as a number of us have mentioned in the course of the day, it's all about uh, transparency, about our decision-making practice and our rules and regulations and so forth. So I'd really like to thank uh, Emilio and all his team for the great job they've done, a lot of hard work. And I would also, and this is important, I'd like to thank everyone that came here and contributed to the discussion because, you know, we all work in the same space, in the same industry, in the same sport, and it's very valuable for us to have the contributions from the audience. You raise, you know, very valid points from your own experience and your own professional lives, and it helps us. It helps us to improve and hopefully with some of the explanations and presentations you've received today, this will also be of, uh, of value for you as you go about your business. So that's all I'd like to say, really. It's uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, you all need to go home or go to the pub and have a drink. Uh, but whatever your respective destinations, thanks again for coming. Safe travels and hope to see you again soon. Thanks.